community manager and I am super excited because look at this host of characters I have. It's a rogues gallery of index investment knowledge. Um, we've got Paul Merriman. We have Chris Pedersen. We have Daryl Balls. And here's who they are. This, yeah, so that, that guy over there in the corner, his name is Daryl. He looks so serious. He's actually a rocket scientist because <laughs> while investing can be complicated, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, but we actually have one here today. Daryl is the chief analyst for Merriman uh, Educational Foundation. And we have the entire Merriman analyst and researching team, pardon me, researcher team with us. We have Paul, the founder, and we have Chris Pedersen, who is the director of research. And uh, he is going to be presenting two funds for life. And Paul will be telling us what 12 decisions will impact our financial futures? So um, I always assume, and this is really bad, that everyone knows who Paul is, but I'm gonna give you a brief intro. Paul began his career in the 1960s, working briefly as a broker for a major Wall Street firm, Shocker. Mm. He concluded that Wall Street was burdened with too many conflicts of interest and decided to help small companies raise venture capital. In 79, he became uh, the president and chairman of a public manufacturing company. He retired in 82 to uh, set up his own investment management firm, which he eventually sold. And in 2013, he created the Merriman Financial Education Foundation, which is dedicated to providing comprehensive financial education to investors with information and tools to make informed decisions in their own best interest and successfully implement their retirement savings program. And he also has a wonderful podcast called Sound Investing. Mm -hmm. I have been a fangirl for years. And if you don't know Paul, or his foundation, his team is really all about teaching us how to best be our own advocate for our investment portfolio. And we're really super lucky and I'm incredibly grateful that they're giving us their time. Hey, Paul, do you wanna say hello to the group? I do, I am ex so excited to be here. I think this is one of the most exciting groups of people in terms of having a chance to change some lives, turn some things that uh, maybe aren't all exactly as they could be to what they should be. Absolutely. So um, we're having a really long agenda. It's a two for one special. Mm -hmm. I love bargains here. We get Chris, Daryl, and Paul. And so here's the scoop. This is gonna be a little bit different than our normal Q and A's and live sessions. We're gonna ask you to hold all your questions until the end of Paul's presentation. And then we're gonna take Q and A, and then we're gonna do Chris's presentation, and then we'll do Q and A about Chris's presentation. And then at the very end, because these guys are being really generous with their time, we're also going to get a general question and answer period. And I expect you guys to bring it on because you guys are the best. So with that said, I am going to remove all of our happy faces from the live stream and just leave you with Paul and his slide deck. And just so that you know, at the very end, if you want to download the materials that Paul and the team have shared with you, please, we've set up a special link at choosefi.com Merriman, uh, forward slash Merriman. And I will be showing that link on and off throughout the presentation. So thank you so much for joining us and spending your Saturday. All right, so let thank me- Thank you. Hang, hang on thank just one second, you. Paul. You got it. Uh, I'll give you the go ahead. And there you go, you are on, oh, take it away, man. Right, thank you, Jen. Really, this is just just phenomenal. I, I, I wanna make uh, one comment before I leave this uh, opening page here. I want you to notice this is about 12 one million dollar decisions and I tell you they're guaranteed to change your financial future now full disclosure because I am in to telling the truth at all times at least the truth as I know it that guarantee does not mean that it will make you more money or less money but I can be assured, and you can too, that it will be different. And my goal is to basically make it better. But there's a spoiler alert. You've oh, this, Paul, I am so sorry. I'm going to interrupt you. I forgot. I was so excited to get you on screen and start this party that I forgot to say, 
this is a huge disclaimer. This event is solely for educational purposes only. We are not your financial advisors. We are not legal uh, advisors. We don't know enough about your situation to give you anything in terms of this. This is general guidance for educational purposes only. Please consult with your financial advisor for any specific questions. And I'm so sorry about that, Paul. I meant to do that earlier. No, I do not want to go to jail. Oh. So <laughs> listen, this is important. In fact, this is a spoiler alert that should come at the beginning of anybody's presentation where they're making recommendations based on past results. Please know there is no risk in the past. We know, I know, Chris and Daryl know exactly what we should have done. In fact, I looked it up a couple of weeks ago. If you had uh, purchased uh, the lottery ticket with 13, 19, 53, 54, 63, and 17, you would have hundreds of millions of dollars. But that's after the drawing that I knew that. So understand that the only weakness in this presentation is it is about the past and the unknown. The unknown is the future, and that is just the reality. So my goal is to show you step-by-step step the things I believe you can do in the future to get the best of the past. And speaking of the best, Warren Buffett, I think, is probably one of the brightest investors. He's not a financial advisor. He's not a certified financial anything, but he does know investing. And my favorite quote of his isn't even about investing per se. It's about to be successful. He says, you only have to do a very few things right in your life so long as you don't do too many things wrong. And I really believe that. So my focus today is really to focus on the right things that you can do. That remember, my goal is every time I bring one of these steps up, it's got to be about a million dollars or I will have failed my promise. So let me talk about this so-called million dollars. And I think what I want to do, just bear with me for one sec. I'm going to grab this pen laser pointer and I want to be able to make sure that you see what I want to talk about here. Here is a scenario that assumes that two people invest. One gets an 8% compound rate of return, investing $6,000 a year. And you do that over 40 years and then you retire. And in retirement, you invest and get 6% a year from which you take 4%. That's number one. Number two person, the second person, is able to make an extra half a percent more. Now, by the way, here we're talking about basically what would be a 401k or an IRA. But believe it or not, this extra half a percent also impacts people who are in retirement. But just looking here at, at this 40 year accumulation period, getting an extra half of 1%, eight and a half, and an extra half a percent, six and a half, while you're retired, remember? And taking out four. Well now, the, the money we make on an investment, is everything above and beyond what we put in. So if you put in $6,000 a year for 40 years, the total investment for both of these investors is $240,000. Everything else that comes out of that investment is the profit. For example, you get to retirement, and by the way, at an 8% compound rate of return, you would have about $1.678 million. If you got one half of 1% more, you would make a total uh, for retirement there of $1.924 million. So there is, there's that first advantage. But you see, the fun is just starting. And I'm thinking about all you, you fire movement folks who want to retire early because the fun with your money starts when you start taking it out. So if in scenario one, you take out 4% a year until age 95, that means 
that uh, you will have taken out $2.6 million out of that $1.6 million approximate dollars. So that's a start in terms of the fun. Then there's the fun your family has after you die, and the, what is left over is the rest of your return on your investment. So you put in 240, you take out 2.6, you pass on 2.8, it means the total return is $5.5 million. What happens when you're able to add an extra half a percent? And it turns out that, remember, we had 1.9 at the point that you retire, but in retirement, you take out 3.2 instead of 2.6. When you die, you leave 3.7 instead of 2.8. The difference between what you lived on and what you left in scenario one and what you lived on and what you left in scenario two is $1.5 million. Now, if we could start with that as an assumption, to see whether we can actually find a half a percent somewhere in, in, in your, the investment process that will help us build towards those $12 million. So let's look at one of those things, a decision, a fork in the road. And this is not about adding a million dollars. This is really this decision, save versus spend. This is really about millions and millions of dollars because to the extent that we can make the decision to save how much and when and where, all of those things are going to translate into the money you're going to have for retirement. And I remember when I was, I was a stockbroker for almost three years back in the 60s. And when I sat with young people, they thought that if they could just get to a million dollars, I remember I even had a goal to be worth a million dollars someday. That was viewed as a big deal. What floors me is when I teach my, I have a university class at Western Washington University in Bellingham, Washington, and I support that class and the professor who teaches it. And I go up every quarter and I teach for two hours. Now, those kids today, when asked, how much would you like to have? When will you have a sense that you've made it? They are still <laughs> focused in on a million dollars. It is still the golden amount. Now, they, they know better at some level, but that's something magical about that idea of a million. If you inflation adjust what we wanted back in the 1960s, that million dollars now needs to be five or six million dollars in order to replicate uh, what we had then. So I really want to see you do all the things that you can uh, to pile that money up for, for your retirement. And by the way, this is, this is not, not about greedy wealth. This is about wealth that comes with the comfort and the, and the ability to do the things you want to do. When I retired at age 40 from my first venture, when I retired at age 40, I then was able to go on. And for the rest of my life, it's still going on right now, do exactly what I wanted to do. So then there is another question, how early you're going to save. And here's just an easy million dollars. When you have your first child, when you have your first grandchild, well, and your second one and your third one too, if you can afford it, if you would just put a dollar a day away from the time they're born until let's say 21 and then they take it from there and they put away a dollar a day until they're 65. So for 65 years, a dollar a day is put away at 10% you'd have a million seven hundred and eighty six thousand two hundred and three dollars okay if you wait until the child is 10 instead of a million seven eighty six it's six eighty six 
there is more than a million dollars in difference just because of approximately $3,650 difference in what money was put in to that portfolio. And it even gets worse if you wait until you're 21, because then the dollar a day from 21 to 65 at 10% turns into $238,000. So the sooner we can get started, the more we're going to have. And the first five years, when you get serious and, and, and you put money away when you're 20, 21, 20, the first five years, for some people can amount to as much as 30 or 40% of what they have when they get to retirement. So starting early is huge. Now you come to a fork in the road and it's a huge fork because it's literally about millions of dollars. Bonds versus stocks. Remember a bond is a loan. You loan $100 to the U.S. government. They promise to pay you back. And if you had done that from 1928 to 2019, that $100 would have turned into about $10,000. But they guarantee there's no risk. You don't have to wake up in the morning and find out the market's down 800 points. It's just slow and steady, smooth sailing, nothing to worry about. Of course, there's taxes and there's inflation, but still you'd have $10,000 from 1928 to 2019. Put that same $100 into 500 companies, may or may not make it. In fact, many of them will go out of business and some of them will grow to be amazingly successful. I'll talk more about that later, but when you own the companies, and that's the beauty of investing today. You can own a whole bunch of companies with $100, but that $100 in the S&P 500 would have grown to $600,000 approximately. That is the difference between owning, having a guarantee, not having to worry about the ups and the downs of the economy. No, you just have to be able to, somebody to write the check to pay you the small amount of interest and give you your principal back from time to time. Stock market, that's, that's risky business. We all know that. But the premium for that risk is gigantic. And so one of the biggest decisions that you will make is how much of your money is in stocks, and how much of your money is in bonds. I am rooting, I really am rooting. When you were in your 20s, when you were in your 30s, you are better off from everything I know about the past if all of that long-term money is in fact in stocks. Now, once you decide to go into the stock market, you come to another fork in the road. It's a million dollar decision. And by the way, it could be many millions of dollars because you can put your money in one stock. A lot of people do. A lot of people make the effort to know enough about a company that they trust that company with all of their money. When, when Enron went out of business, there were thousands of people who worked for Enron that had all of their company money in their 401k. And by the way, it's important to remember that the, the officers of Enron even encouraged their employees to put all of their retirement into Enron. But there's a problem with one stock. That one stock, like Enron, like Eastern Airlines, like Washington Mutual, that company can go broke. And so if the decision is one or many, believe it or not, in the investing community today. This was not true when I was in my 20s and started in this industry. In this industry today, with virtually $100, you can own basically all stocks, certainly little tiny pieces, but all of them. And here is what I find to be one of the most fascinating things. I would never have believed this when I started in the industry back in the 1960s. 
the expected rate of return, according to the academic community, of a portfolio that has more diversification than another, the one with more diversification is likely to get a higher rate of return. Now, that's not what we were taught back in the 60s. We were taught if you had 10 or 20 stocks in a portfolio, that was diversification. Well, it turns out that was very misleading. And if you get a chance, I want to encourage you to read. Uh, it's on the internet. It's, it's called Do Stocks Outperform Treasury Bills by Dr. Besson Binder. And the bottom line of this study is Dr. Besson Binder and all the people who worked with him, they looked at all of the returns of all the public companies from 1926 to 2016. And out of all of those companies, I believe there were some 23,000 public companies that they tracked. One out of 25, 4% of the companies produced most of this return that we talk about in the investment community. If you ask people, what should you expect to get in the S&P 500, which is most of the US market, most people will say, well, historically it's made about 10%. Turns out that's right. And over most long periods of time, it does make around 10%. But that 10% mostly comes from the 4% of those companies. They looked at the 96%. The average return of the other 96% was 3%. You would have, if you were unlucky enough to only invest in those companies that weren't part of that top 4%, you would have had the same return as if you had invested in a risk-free T-bill, U.S. government T-bill. So here's the part that's the academics. I think it's a clear case. How lucky are we going to be as investors? Do we think that we or somebody else can pick out the top 4%? Well, there's no evidence of that. In fact, the evidence is, is that 90 to 95% of professional money managers cannot do better than the index themselves over 15 years. One year at a time, about half of them do. But when you get out to 15 years, it's only five to 10% of active managers, smart managers, are able to, in essence, beat the index itself. Well, if the odds are that low, you know, the answer is, why don't you just buy the indexes? Why don't you just own the market yourself? And if you're going to own the market, that means you're probably going to do that through mutual funds or exchange-traded funds and, and, and have a portfolio built with thousands of companies. According to the academics, the single most impactful variable in terms of how you do amongst different funds that are in the same asset class, like if you looked at all of the large company managers and all of the small company managers and uh, whatever that way of distinguishing one group from another, the variable that leads to the highest rate of return in each of those groups is the expense of operating that mutual fund, which means that if we invest in mutual funds with lower expenses, that is a way that you might pick up an extra quarter of a percent or maybe half a percent. Remember, that's the magic number we're looking for, half a percent. So if you could reduce the expenses and if that translates into a higher return, it says that you can, in fact, control yourself what is going to happen to your money by simply investing in lower cost mutual funds. Now, I didn't say lower cost mutual funds in the total market. In each part of the market, if it's value, you want low cost. 
If it's growth, you want low cost. If it's U.S., you want low cost. International, it is in each group. So you can't necessarily expect a low cost, big stock company mutual fund to do better than a slightly higher expense in a small cap fund because the small cap fund from all of history should produce better returns than large. We're going to get to that in just a minute. But what I'm saying is that we can pick off. We can go into mutual funds that have re expenses literally at, 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 at fidelity. You can get a mutual fund for the S&P 500, for example, with zero expense ratio. You can also buy those mutual funds at 1%, very similar mutual funds that represent large cap blend. There's that half a percent. If you could go from one to zero, you are on your way theoretically to more than a million dollars. So low expenses over high. And then you come to another fork in the road. Now, this fork in the road takes into consideration a lot of these things that we're looking to help you get better rates of return. But there's the, 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 the argument about, are you better off having professional money managers who pick the stocks carefully, who maybe go through the S&P 500 and they pull out all the really good companies and they get rid of the bad companies so that you've got this mutual fund that's made up with these, these gems. Now, one of the problems is when you pick up a fund with just the gems and you don't get the rest of the companies, you now have less diversification. So you have just raised your risk with active management because you have fewer companies. And then, of course, because you got to pay these people who actively manage these funds a fair amount of money, all of a sudden, the expenses go up and the index funds have lower expenses. We already talked about that maybe zero, maybe one-tenth of one percent for, for an index fund versus one percent. And then another break is that the index funds are more tax efficient. And one of the reasons they're more tax efficient is because they have less buying and selling. It's called turnover. And that turnover that's minimized, that increases the likely return over a lifetime, and it is increased inside of the mutual fund in terms of the expenses of buying and selling, and it is also minimized outside of the mutual fund in terms of the taxes you're going to pay. And remember, only about 1 in 10 or 1 in 20 active managers are going to beat the index funds. So I think, I really do think, active versus passive, I think you're going to find that the index funds are a real bonus in terms of extra return. And let me tell you another reason why I think index funds are better than active. When we know that the fund we own represents an asset class. I don't mean it represents, you know, 10 great companies. No, it represents the whole asset class. It could be 500 companies. It could be 2,000. In fact, in fact there's, there's, a, there's an index that's got about 5,000 companies in it. But what you get in that is the return of that asset class that it gets over a long period of time. And there's nobody in there second guessing anything. So when the market goes down, you expect it to go down. And that happens from time to time. Okay, it goes down. And that's part of that risk you take to get all that extra return. But when you have an active manager and the market goes down, you're maybe asking yourself, hey, wait a minute. Didn't I pay these people something to protect me against the market going down? It's, it's, it's not just that I want them to do the right thing on the way up. Of course I do. But why aren't they taking care of me on the way down? And they don't. History shows they don't. That their losses are just as great, in fact, sometimes considerably more because of the challenges of managing an actively 
managed portfolio advantage indexing higher degree of trust that what is being done is in your best interest so i think it's a big decision now let's talk about some real easy ways to pick up an extra half of one percent and i'm going to just go through a little analysis here of what what not only I know, but every, by the way, I am not an academic, but I am sharing the work that comes out of the academic community. And here's what we know about the past. There are, there's an asset class that basically people uh, think of the S&P 500 when they think of large cap blend. Large cap blend means some growth and some value growth those are the popular companies those are the companies in hot industries places where tons of money is being made lots of confidence in the future then there are the value companies they're not so exciting in fact oftentimes they pay big dividends and they seem to be a little outdated and and so that's the value group they've got they've got some problems sometimes it's their image sometimes it's their industry but people aren't willing to pay much for those companies. So it has both, which, which is good, because if you had only growth historically, you would have made less money than having some of both, because growth over time has not made as much as value. In fact, the blend gets 9.9 .9 from uh, 28 to 2019 here, and the large cap value gets 11.1, .1, better than a 1% better return. That's good. We're looking for those 1% returns. Well, wait a minute. Here's small cap blend, value and growth, but smaller companies. Since 1928, a 12% compound rate of return. But then if we want to go to a small cap value, it is both small, so it picks up that premium, and value, it picks up that premium, so that over the last 92 years, the compound rate of return has been 13.2. Now, I am 76 years old. I don't want to have too much really risky things in my portfolio. I do have small cap value in my portfolio, but it's certainly not all of my portfolio. But look at here. If you were to take these four major asset classes, small value, large value, small blend, large blend, the compound rate of return rebalanced once a year, 11.8 versus 9.9. .9. I was looking for one half a percent. I'm starting to think right here. I may have four times one half a percent with this difference between the S&P 500 and these four funds together as a group. But wait a minute, there's a risk. Remember with T-bills and even intermediate term government bonds, if there are any losses, they are very, very, very small. Here, if we look at this one year at a time, yeah, the very best one year return was 54, but the worst was 43. 43 as a loss, not a gain. 61 was the worst year for elk large cap value. 48 for small cap blend. 55 for small cap value. And about 52 for the four fund combo. So there's nothing low risk about any of these, including the S&P 500. And Warren Buffett has said, if you're not willing to lose half of your money, you shouldn't be in the stock market. Twice during the period from 2000 to 2009, the S&P 500 fell by over 50%. So this is not an easy path to financial success for many if you think short term. What if we look long term? Let's say, let's say that's what we cared about is the long term. In fact, if we knew the market was down right now, we might say, hey, that's good. We want to buy stuff when it's down. Warren Buffett likes to buy stuff when it's down. Why shouldn't we? So here's what we know. When we look through every 40-year period since 1928, there are 52 of them. 
With the LCB, large cap blend, the average compound rate of return was 11. That's good. Large cap value, 13.5. Small cap blend, 13.8. And small cap value, 16.2. Now, I am not expecting 16.2, 13.8, 13.5, or 11. Because I don't know what the future will bring. I'm hoping for average. Average would be wonderful. But look at the best. Let's let's just look at the S&P 500. The best 40-year period was a gain of 12.5. The worst was a gain of 8.9. The worst. By the way, if you look, if you you saw the pages of inflation-adjusted returns, these returns are within 1% of each other when adjusted for inflation because this great return here was made during a period of time that inflation was relatively high. Hmm. That's important too. Four fund combo. Here it is, well diversified, thousands of companies in your portfolio, and the average compound rate of return is 13.8. And it has some S&P 500. It's not like I'm saying don't put money in the S&P 500. I'm just saying that if you want to get a higher rate of return, and this looks to be, by the way, 11 to 12, 12 to 13, 13 to 13.8, that's almost a 3% extra percentage points if, in fact, you got the average for the four fund combo. Who knows? I wish. For you, by the way, I'll be long gone. So, makes sense to say then, if we want to make a better rate of return, add some small caps. S and P nine point nine, small cap blend twelve. Add some value, large cap value twelve, small cap value thirteen point two. And I think it's important to understand that most of America's money. Is, 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 is in growth. Growth is attractive because they're the companies that are knocking it out of the ballpark. And people think because they've been up a lot lately uh, that they are the path to more of that same. A lot of people got caught in 1999 and 2000 putting all of their confidence in growth What's not to like about the five years ending 1999? As a matter of fact, the S&P 500 at the end of that five years compounded at 28.5% for five years. When asked in surveys what the people thought the next 10 years would bring, the results came in 20 to 30% because we are caught by recency bias. We just seem to attach ourselves to what's been doing well lately. Our, our, our lizard brain loves that stuff. But over the next 10 years, what happened to the S&P 500 and all that growth? Well, for one thing, a lot of those companies went away. I mean, just literally were gone. But over that 10-year period, that value, small and large, making over 7%, um, they did well while the S&P 500 actually lost about 1% a year, compounded, compounded. And good to add international, because it turns out, as you're going to see in a second, that adding internationals to your portfolio could in fact add another half of 1%. Having said that, and I'll show you why in just a second, I think a lot of you uh, would feel as it is normal, a home bias. People like to invest in the country they know. By the way, this, this is true in New Zealand, just like it is in the U.S. Now, how you get in the market. This one and the next slide have some similarities to them, but very specifically here, I want to talk about what your strategy is to get in the market. Because the two choices seem to be 
that you're going to dollar cost average in. If you've got $100 to go in, you book, you go in every month and you buy your S&P 500 fund. And if the price is down, you're guaranteed to buy more shares than if the price is up. But it most importantly guarantees that you buy when the price is down. A lot of people, they really look at the market and they get a feeling. They get a feeling that this is not the right time to get in the market. And any time that you get that feeling, you may say, you know, rather than putting that money in now, I think I'm going to wait until things look a little better. I'm going to wait until the smoke has cleared. And the problem is that means that more than likely you're going to be hesitant to invest when the market is most appetizing. Because when the market is down and dirty, that is the very best thing that could happen to somebody who's in the accumulation stages. It's old people like me. I don't want the market to go down 50%. I'm not looking for bargains. I'm looking to survive in, a, in, in retirement. But you, if you are accumulating, you want the opportunity for bargains. In fact, I have met young people sometimes, let's say around uh, 30 to 40 years old, more like 40, and, and, and they will have accumulated quite a bit of money, scared to death. They want to get out of the market. So I say, look, how about this? How about if you're really uncomfortable, but you got a lot of money, in fact, you've got so much money already built up here. If you could just get a pretty good return on that money and not take any big, big risks, I think you got it made. So why don't we do this? Why don't we go 60-40 on that money? Not just for the next month or not this the next year, but let's consider going 60-40, 60 equity, 40 fixed income for the rest of your accumulating career. But let's look at all the new money that you're putting in the market. If the market's going to be rough for the next few years, wouldn't it be better to put all your money with that new money, dollar cost averaging, hoping the market will do that bad thing that you're afraid of? So you really have two portfolios. One is your I've made it portfolio. And the other is, well, I want to make it better and I want to take the right risk during the next 10 years that will give me a chance to take advantage of a big bull market that will come at likely at some point in that 10 year period. That even happened, by the way, in 29 to 38. If you invested in the last half of that decade, yeah, there were some tough times. But you walked away, if you dollar cost average, you walked away with a big profit. I must warn, single stocks with dollar cost averaging don't work always. Yes, you'll buy more shares when the market's down. Yes, you'll buy fewer shares when the market's up. Yes, that part works. But that individual company can go broke, in which case all that dollar cost averaging was for naught. On the other hand, on the other hand, dollar cost averaging with an index fund or a regular fund can also fail on the short term. It doesn't mean that because you dollar, in fact, let's say right now you, you inherited $100,000 and, and you wanted to put it in the market and you wanted to dollar cost average because you didn't want to plunk it in there all at one time. Okay, so here's the problem. If you dollar cost average, let's say over 24 months, and you put away one twenty-fourth every month for 24 months. And you do it. Your discipline is perfect. And during that 24 months, you feel pretty lucky because during the whole 24 months, it went up slowly. And so you kept making money, making money. Only when you finally finished getting that $100,000 in there, did it then fall off a cliff for a while. See, you, you can never be sure that dollar cost averaging is going to work on the short-term basis. All right. Market timing versus buy and hold. Well, that what I just talked about is a form of, 
of market timing. But I want to talk about another kind of market timing that destroys portfolios. I mean it. It destroys portfolios. And I don't even know that the people understand it and the real cost. Uh, a lot of people bailed out in 2008 or 2009, particularly the spring of 2009. You know, the market had gone down 25% through August of 2008. A lot of people thought that was the end of the decline. It was a good time to get in. But then what happened between August and March, before it turned around and went up, it went down another 40%. It was a really tough market for people. A lot of people threw in the towel. They did a market timing move. I don't care whether you you get out uh, out of just plain fear. It's what I call the ICSIA strategy. It's the I can't stand it anymore the market timing strategy. I don't care why you might bail out. But if you bail out for any kind of an emotional, uh, a motivated reason, more than likely it's not going to work. And what happened to a number of those people who bailed out in 2008 and 2009, they completely missed the next big bull market. One of the biggest bull markets in history, if not the biggest yeah, in, in some areas. So, so I really don't want people to be in a market timing mode. And the reality is after we have bear markets, particularly severe bear markets, the market comes back. I mean, it's amazing how fast it can come back. In the 1930s, I don't remember if it was 37 or what year it was right now, but in two months in a row, a July and an August, the market each month went up over 37%. Now that, that what do you do? You're paralyzed. And then after it's gone up 37% for two months in a row, now what do you do? Wait for it to come back down? It makes investing almost impossible once you try to become a market timer. Because once you are a market timer, you think you have some responsibility for deciding whether to be in or out of the market. How would you know that? You can't know that. You may know from all of history that if you just dollar cost averaging in and you stay the course and you have the right amount of fixed income as you age to protect against market declines. No, there's a point that you shouldn't be all in equities. There's plenty of information about that. But I can't find one piece of information that suggests that people sitting back over their horn rim glasses making these decisions whether to be in or out of the market. By the way, you might make the mistake of listening to uh, Jim Cramer. One day, one day, I had somebody, a friend, called recently, actually a relative, called, they're not in the stock market at all. They're all in CDs and bonds. They are retired, but they wanted to know what I thought about getting in the silver industry, get some silver right now. They heard something on the radio or they read an article. And somebody who does not believe in taking risk, all of a sudden they were suckered right in there chasing the, the silver bullet or whatever it is. But when you come out of bear markets, whoa, the returns can be amazing the early years. And it is really important, as I said before, if you want to do some sort of timing, the most important timing that you are ever going to do is determine how much you should have it in fixed income at every year of your life. That would be a timing commitment that would be worthwhile figuring out. Now, you're about to hear about target date funds from Chris. And I think what he's going to show you is some of the most interesting information I have seen in all my years of being around this business, over 50 years. But I'm just going to say this. For the majority of people, and I'm not talking about the 51% majority, I'm talking about the 91% majority, target date funds offer the most dependable route to financial success. And you don't have 
to do a thing but pick the target date fund. And in most cases, that's going to be in your 401k, and there is no choice because they only give you one family, hopefully Vanguard. Hopefully Vanguard. But with a target date fund, somebody automatically manages your money. Somebody already has what they call the glide path, the, 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 the period of time that you're going to be switching from equity to fixed income. And literally, you could get into that at age 20 or age 15. You could get into it and stay in that target date fund for the rest of your life. I mean, literally, you would never have to make another change. And you would know that your money is being taken care of as carefully as those people know. And remember I said index funds, low cost, low turnover, all those things. Make sure you get a target date fund that has index funds to use to build the funds, the target date fund. And if your company doesn't have index funds, let's, let's talk to the trustees. Let's, uh, let's see if we can't give them an education as to why that would be in other people's best interest. Now, I'm going to do this quickly because I'm sure I'm over my allotted time. Sorry, Chris. Um, portfolio one. I want to make the case for building a portfolio that includes large, small, value, growth, U.S. and international. I want to, I want to let you see it happen right in front of your eyes over time. Here's portfolio one, S&P 500, all in stock. Over the last 50 years, a 10.6% compound rate of return. And that would have turned $100,000 without adding money, without taking money away. It would turn it into over $15 million. If you took 10% of that money and you put it in large cap value, indexing, indexing, not Trying to pick the best large cap value companies, own them all. So 90% in the S&P 500, 10% in large cap value. It adds a lousy two tenths of 1%, but it also adds 1.5 million to the value of the portfolio over the 50 year period. Then you add 10% in small cap blend. Now you're up another 2%, two tenths of 1%. Now you're up to 18 million. Then you add small cap value. Remember that was the best of the bunch? Well, in this particular case, that 10% adds about three tenths of 1%. Now you're up to 21.5 million. Now you add US REITs, particularly in tax deferred accounts, generally not in taxable accounts, but now you're up to 11.4. Okay, you only added one-tenth of 1%. 1 That's fine, but it's an asset class that doesn't go up and down with the S&P 500 over here. And that extra one-tenth of 1% 1 added about another 700,000. That's okay. Then all at one time, four four different asset classes, some international large cap blend, large cap value, small cap blend, and small cap value. And so in that one move, it goes from 11.4 to 12. But that's four 10% increments. And now you're up to 29 million. And then let's add one more, emerging markets. Yeah, wild and crazy and all of that. And very often the very best. In fact, there was a five-year period. They were number one every year for five years. Now, over the whole period, it adds about six-tenths, 37 million. This is the 10-fund strategy. This is what my wife and I have in our retirement. In the equity portion, then we have half in bonds. So that's appropriate for 76. I'm 76. She's younger, but not much. So it's appropriate. In fact, a lot of our money is, in essence, being managed for our kids because we're not, hopefully not going to spend it all. But you got the idea. You build a portfolio of a whole bunch of different asset classes. Too much work. Let me show you a way that uh, and Daryl uh, Daryl Balls, who will be with us in a few minutes when we get into the Q&A, uh, he's the one that produces all of these, almost all of these tables. 
And, uh, and, and so here's a table he produced for what we call the four fund combo strategy. This is only the equity portion. 25% S&P 500, 25% U.S. large cap value, 25% U.S. small cap blend, 25% U.S. small cap value from 15.4 to 19.4, to 22.5 to 32.5, 12.3% compound rate of return, very little difference in the standard deviation. The volatility is very, very similar. And yet the return to you and your family, uh, it, it, can, it can be a ton of money. Uh, here is one of many tables. Let me just, I'm gonna tell you this so quickly. On our site, and I'm going to show you where in just a few minutes, there are tables galore for people who like tables of numbers. Daryl, I think, has produced over 80 different kinds of tables. Tables to help you depend how much in stocks and how much in bonds. Tables to help you decide how much to take out of your investments in retirement. Help you figure out when you have enough. But there are dozens of ways you can take money out of your investments in retirement. We will show you a whole bunch of them. But this is a table. You won't see this exact table there, but it's this is a consolidation of a whole bunch of those tables. But if you had a portfolio, 80% in equity, 20% in fixed income, and you did it with the S&P 500, or you did it with the 10 fund solution, or you did it with the four fund solution. We can see if you started out with $1,000 a year or $83.33 a month, and every year you upped it by 3%, 1,030, 1,061, 1,093. You did that for 50 years, 1970 through 2019. You would have invested in all three of those portfolios $112,797. And the end result down here for the old ultimate buy and hold is $2.6 million for the four fund combo. This is at the end of 50 years, by the way, $2.9 million. And I'm sorry, but I can't see down here. Uh, how much I have in the S and P, but I think it's something like a million two or a million three. But 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 the bottom line is, it gives you a chance to kind of ride the bucking bronco. Remembering in the early years, you are king. It is your money that's making all the money. You put in a thousand bucks, and it goes up a thousand dollars. Your thousand dollars is what is in there that me that means a lot to your final result when you're ready to retire. Later, when you've got 100,000 or 200,000, another $1,000 doesn't make as much difference. But early on, you are in charge of how big this gets to be. So we've got a website, Sound Investing for Every Stage of Life. We wanna help your kids when they're 20 or your parents when they're 90. We're trying to educate folks and there is absolutely zero profit. We are not a profit-making organization, just the opposite. We are a nonprofit foundation. The three people you're going to hear from today, not a, none of us make a penny off this organization, but our heart and soul is in it. Here is that best advice that I talked about. Underneath best advice, you're going to find over links to over 40 tables you're going to find recommendations for ETFs. In fact, this is a spot, this link right here. When you hear Chris speak, you are going to want to go to that link and check it out because he's got some great articles there. And there's information on target date funds. And then free books. And right now we are working on a book that includes $12 million decisions and two funds for life, all under one umbrella, absolutely free to all the folks who sign up for our newsletter. In other words, they will automatically be sent out to all of our newsletter subscribers. And then what I'm hoping for, you don't have to 
pay me any money, but if you want to pay me, you take that book and you send it to every 20 something that you know and offer to take them to dinner if they read it. Do something. Do something to motivate them to read it. And to people who really are interested in supporting a financial education cause, we are a nonprofit. Almost all of the money in the kitty has come from my good fortune uh, in the business of helping others with their money. Uh, and uh, not only am I supporting this effort, but I underwrite a class at Western Washington University where uh, we're making sure these uh, students come out of there ready to know to know what to do with their 401k. So I hope all of that helps. I hope we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, let me know what I've got here, Jen, and, 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 and I'm here for, to answer as long as you let me. Oh, you know what? We have a full audience. We have 190 viewers right now currently oh, watching great, your presentation. Great. And I think we're gonna have some stellar questions. And so let's open it up. It's your turn, guys. For all of you watching, this is the time to put Paul in the hot seat. <laughs> and let's see what we've got here. Oh, wow, we've got some great um, response though. I just wanted to let you know that we have a ton of people from all over the world. We've got Germany, Malaysia, all over the US. And Maribel McNeil writes, thank you, Paul. Can't wait to watch it later. Love your podcast. And I have to admit, I totally agree. Totally love your podcast. I'm very impressed that you updated all the tables for 2020 um, on your April, I think it was your last April Sound Investing podcast. You went ahead and, up, and mentioned that you had updated the ultimate buy and hold mm -hmm, strategy, mm -hmm. fine tuning yeah. your asset allocation. And I'm going to bring the team back onto the screen right now because let's see if we can get some great questions from the audience and participating. But I enjoyed listening to that. Um, update that you had. So those of you at Choose FI uh, watching, please, 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 please join us and ask all the fabulous questions that you have. And here's, see, there's the man of the hour. There's Paul in the corner. And um, let's see what we've got. So, um, oh, John. So John has a question. It's actually jumping uh, ahead with Chris's presentation. I'm going to wait until Chris's comes up and we'll ask John's question. So I, I see you, John, don't worry. Um, we have Nandini Razi, and please pardon me if I mispronounce your first name. She would like advice for us, those of us who are 70 years old. What do you think? And by the way, again, I'm going to put the disclaimer out there. This is for educational purposes only. We are not your financial advisors. Please consult with people who actually are your financial advisors and legal um, advisors as well, since they'll know more about your situation. All right, guys, what do you guys think about um, Nandini's Rossi's question? Please provide advice for us at 70 years old. Wow. I mean, this starts probably with a meeting with somebody who can ask her a bunch of questions. Mm -hmm. You know, the implication is that she's not been a big saver, or if she was, there was a mistake made along the way, or maybe she just wants to take whatever portfolio she has and convert it into something that she can use from now on. It's, there's, it's hard to know exactly what where she's yeah. coming from, but let's assume she's got a bunch of money. Mm -hmm. And she wants to invest that someplace safe. Well, her risk tolerance is number one. How much risk is she willing to take? How much money does she need to, to take out of that whatever bundle of money that she has? Those are all open-ended questions that somebody, she needs to talk with somebody who would look at what she has, how much, what she needs, find out what her risk tolerance is. Maybe she should be in a, Wellesley Fund or a Wellington Fund at Vanguard, which is a you know one fund answer that's a balanced fund. Mm -hmm. Maybe she should have part of her money in a in a single premium life annuity that guarantees her so much like a pension for the rest of her life, and the rest of it she could be more aggressive with. So it's it's there is no way. What would Daryl? What would you do? Hey Daryl, you're on. You screen, look like hi. you could be close to seventy someday. Oh my goodness. 
Yeah, way, way in the future. <laughs> <laughs> way to put him in the hot well, seat and wake him up. So, Daryl, what yeah, would no, you do? Well, I think I th Chris actually has a good section in his presentation coming up. Uh, Paul's right. You need to understand your, amazingly, Paul's right. You need to understand your, 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 your risk tolerance. But given that you have a good handle on that, then you need to understand how your portfolio size compares to what you need. And then once you understand that, then I think some of the information that uh, Chris will present here in the next uh, presentation can be very helpful. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I'm just a, I'm just a, a money nerd. I'm not at all professional, but I would agree. It's about assessing what your goals are. That's a very broad question, Nandini, and um, it depends on your personal goals. Uh, whether or not you want to leave a legacy, do you have enough cash flow to support you at 70? What kind of risk tolerance you have? What other assets do you have? And um, there's a change in RMDs right now. And again, we are not your tax advisors. So please, um, you know, but I would like to hear what Chris has to say too. Uh, the talk to an advisor would be the starting point, you know, or a financial planner. I, I think that the only thing I'd add to that is it doesn't have to be super expensive. There are a lot of people who will do hourly consults and it's, you know, the- Absolutely. It's not gonna be for free, but it might be, you know, a couple hundred dollars if you're lucky, something like that. It'll be money well spent. Mm -hmm. it, it really, I, it's a very complicated question without getting a lot more data. And that's the kind of thing a financial planner will do. And a lot of them really have their heart in the right place. They're there to try and help people. So. And while we're there, Nandini, what I would hope is that you would go to NAPFA and look for a fee only advisor yes. that is not trying to sell you anything that is not commission based and that they really will act as a fiduciary in your best interest. Mm -hmm. And that is the big advice I would give you. Jen, um, can I add, add something course. to that? I think NASA is a great organization. They're they're going to be uh, likely more than two hundred dollars an hour, and uh -huh. likely be a very extensive plan. Um, Garrett Planning Network is another oh, source of uh, hourly people. They are happy, and many of them, to manage for a percentage of your assets, but their contract with Garrett is they have to also offer hourly, and. In the Seattle area, I have finally found a $200 an hour advisor who is very experienced, who really cares ab about young people. That's hard to find advisors who want to spend a lot of time. And I don't mean a lot of time in order to build them a lot, but I mean they want to mm -hmm. have part of their practice be uh, with folks like that. And that, that is absolutely golden. And if anybody wants me to share that name, they can just email me, paul at paulmerriman.com, and I will send you her name and her phone number. And and she's not as old as I am, but, but boy, she's well experienced. Well, and I would actually say for us older people that are not in our 20s, that it might be nice to actually find some fee-only advisors that actually have a span that has uh, lived through an experienced economic downturn. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to admit, not trying to do ver reverse ageism or anything, but there is something to be said to have uh, a few years of experience underneath you. But yes, the XY Planning Network is also a great resource. I also like going to the CFP uh, .net site, which is the organization that actually certifies your financial planners. But my big thing is always, always, always vet whoever you go with, right? So um, anyway, we have more questions. They're just packing up right now. So Jack Barr or Bar Jack asks, what would have been the difference in returns for a two fund portfolio versus the 10 fund portfolio? Anyone? Yeah, Daryl? Well. <laughs> I, I can well, take that. Yeah. yeah, that's Chris. Yeah. Okay, Chris. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the short answer is the if the ultimate buy and hold portfolio is all equities, and that's the way Paul just described it, it's going to do better because it there's no risk management in the ultimate buy and hold portfolio. There's mm -hmm. risk management in a two fund portfolio. So, um, you know, if you wanted an apples to apple, uh, uh, maybe a more sophisticated question would be uh, how 
what percentage of fixed income would I have in an ultimate buy and hold portfolio before it would perform the same way? Mm. And, and I can't actually tell you that off the top of my head. It's a good question. I'm working on it. <laughs> so we'll have a better answer later. But uh, straight up, if you have an all equity portfolio, it's very likely going to outperform something like a two fund for life portfolio that has fixed income in it. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And it'll then do it with more risk, more drawdown, but it'll have higher end balance. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we have this really great question from Dylan Rhodes. Paul, you have your various allocations, 10 fund, et cetera, set up as pies and M1 finance, correct? And that is correct. In fact, uh, part of the resources that we're sending you have a reference also to M1 and some of uh, Paul's strategies. If you go to choosefi.com forward slash Merriman, and it's an easy way to, for people to get started. Is that correct, Paul? It, it is, but but to be fair here, the man behind the curtain who has done the work with M1 is Chris. And <gasps> so, right. yeah, I'm yeah. There. You see, I, <laughs> I'm I, shocked. I, easy peasy. I, I get so much credit for stuff that I had nothing to do with. No, Chris, why don't you take that? It, well, I'm not sure I really understand what the question is. It is an easy way to do it. Yeah. Oh, they, they're just wanting confirmation that M1 oh, is, okay, yes. is a, an yes. easy way. But, um, and, I, and to be fair, Paul has other resources. You guys have all modeled portfolios that mm. follow Paul's philosophy and your foundation's philosophy on your website, correct? Yes, we have recommended portfolios at Vanguard, at Schwab, at Fidelity, at T. Rowe Price. We have Schwab ETFs and mutual funds. We have the two funds for life. We got the four funds. We got the ten <laughs> funds. Uh, yes, yes. And at some at some point, this madness has got to stop, and and we'll no. quit. We'll <laughs> quit adding portfolios. But what we're trying to figure out, uh, and part of this was 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 started by John Bogle. John mm -hmm. Bogle laughed at me. He mocked me. I was with him in a meeting in his office, and he said rightly so that my work. And, this, and, and my work is complex because it's the work I used to manage money for people. They uh -huh. didn't have to do it. But he's right. People need a simple solution. And Chris has really come up with what I think is a simple solution in the two funds. And Daryl's got the four funds. And, um, and, and I'm just happy to have these two guys working with our foundation. Well, and as an ultimate fangirl of all of your work, I'm going to dub myself that. I have to admit that I really enjoy the fact that you've given us the tables, you've given us the resources, that you've actually modeled out these portfolios and your philosophy at as many brokers as possible. Because I'm a DIYer, and I'm and, and I don't want to pay fees. <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, Chad Hill, he asks, have you thought of or given finance classes for low income inner city or rural areas? That's over our our head, I think. Uh, I, I will give you I'll give your listeners, our viewers today, a resource that I think is absolutely amazing. It's N as in Nancy, G as in general, P as in Paul, F as in finance dot org. Next generation personal finance. Next generational personal finance. If you are somebody wanting to educate, they have curriculum K through 12. They have games you can play. They will, parents could take this information and use it to teach their kids. It is all free. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. actually, they are actually paying for grants to encourage teachers in school districts to get personal finance as a required course in high school. Well, and I'm going to mention, not to steal Paul's thunder, but uh, Choose FI has our own foundation, and we've actually developed curriculum as well. So not only do we have the FI 101 course, whose link I'm displaying currently, that anyone can sign up for, it is completely free, but we have also made free our K through 12 curriculum as well. And I'll get that link and throw that up for you, and so that you can also go back and visit it as, as well. But um, NPF Next Gen, um, Paul, maybe one of you guys can message me and I'll add it to the uh, live stream chat. Does that sound good? Yeah, and, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll do that. 
Okay, thank you so much. I don't want to mistype and because you know URLs and all that. Okay, so going back to the other questions, I mean they are just coming in on the fly. So how long do we have until next year, right, to get all these questions answered? <laughs> okay, so then uh, Popeye Larue writes: Is there any upside in bond funds as a ballast versus MMFs? I'm assuming that's mon money market funds. Oh, I, I can take that if nobody else wants to. Huh? I don't oh. want it. Okay. <laughs> it's yours. Okay. Um, look, bond funds are for stability. Um, I don't look to bond funds to make money. I look at bond funds to keep from losing money when we're in a catastrophic event. If we're not in a catastrophic event, I'd much rather be, in theory, all in equities because that's, that's where the money is made. But at 76, the reason I'm 50% in bonds, and all the bonds are government bonds. Now, they're not individual bonds. They're mutual funds, uh, that are, but they're government bond funds. In the taxable part of the portfolio, they're tax-exempt bonds. But uh, they are there that when things really get bad, like 2008, 2008, what happened? The market was down about 40%. The short to intermediate government bonds were up about seven. Now, long bonds were up a lot, a lot more than that, but long bonds are pretty volatile. So I think that if I'm going to try to stabilize the portfolio, I'd rather do it that way than I want to with a money market fund. But let me just give you one more situation. My wife and I, we take our annual income from a distribution that comes to us the first week of the year. It goes into a short-term Vanguard investment grade bond fund. And from that, we take the monthly distributions for that year. And over time, the money we'll get in a short-term investment grade bond fund should add a point to a point and a half, maybe more than I'll get in a money market fund. Mm -hmm. Daryl, you got anything, anything to add? No, that's what we do. Yeah. I love it. Okay. And, um, oh, Jeffrey Gross has a great question. Let me get that on screen for you. Let's see. All right. Is there a strategy or reason for the order that you add each asset class to the S&P for the ultimate buy and hold strategy? Um, no. They kind of go together. We look at all the U.S. first starting with large, which is where people normally think all the money should be is in the S&P 500. By the way, the total market index and the S&P 500 have virtually the same return. Actually, the S&P is two tenths of 1% better for 92 years. So people think there's some magic in the total market index. No, there, there isn't, but it is where people typically like to invest. So then the next step down in risk is large cap value, then the next is small cap blend, then the next is small cap value. REITs are kind of an, out, an outlier. And uh, as you saw, they don't make too much difference in the result. And then we just unload the same series of, uh, of, of the uh, internationals. So it's, it's not a random event, but it kind of tries to follow the thinking of how an investor might understand putting that all together. That was what was behind that series. It also doesn't, I mean, it, it, the, the real goal is where you end up at the end with the worldwide ultimate buy and hold portfolio. And, and it really doesn't matter the order in which you add them. Uh, what you're doing is taking 10% sequentially away from S&P and putting it in a different asset class. At the end, you're 10% you're in 10 different funds and it doesn't matter how you got there. Uh, it, it's the, it's just a build-up process to show how you can can how the incremental change in in asset classes by adding them in asset classes changes your returns. The important point is where you end up. All right. And I, wow, we have a ton of questions here. So uh, Connor Dixon writes. Obviously, you aren't acting as our advisors here, but I guess this could be framed as: What would you do at 25 years old? Is it sufficient to only invest in a total stock market? fund or can a small cap value fund, a uh, large cap value fund and international funds add value to the mix? And I... That's gotta be Chris. Okay, Chris. Uh, 
Okay, sure, I'll take that one. Um, it, if you invest in the market overall, you're exposing yourself just to one thing, basically, which is market risk. Mm -hmm. And it, even though it's kind of funny, you think, wait a minute, I've got small in there, I've got big in there, I've got value, I've got growth, but um, they offset one another. So it's like the it, it, think of it as a it's like a table, and and it's all and, and it's balancing on one point, right? And it's all balanced. So until you own a little bit more of value or a little bit more of small than is in the total market, that table doesn't tilt. But as soon as you start to own a little bit more value, a little bit more small, the table starts to tilt and your likely long-term returns go up. So yeah, um, if you're a young investor, you've got the years to wait out the time that an inst an institutional investor can't wait out, right? You can be patient. Um, you can dollar cost. You can buy stuff on sale, and you can get the benefit of those those factors that don't necessarily pay off in a year or two or five or even ten, but over the lifetime, it's it's probably a prudent thing to do. Yeah. So yeah, yeah for a young investor, great idea. Well, Chris, I'm going to ask you then, would you still think it's a great idea for those of us who are on the financial independence path and we're looking at very aggressive savings and heavy duty investments and a shortened time frame to retiring early? So we'll talk about this a little bit in my presentation, but um, sorry, as you get, as you, no, it's all right. As you get closer to retirement, most people tolerate less risk, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you've like way oversaved, right? If you're Warren Buffett's wife, you, you can tolerate all the risk in the world, which is why why Warren Buffett's recommendation of ninety percent S and P five hundred, ten percent bonds works great for her because she could experience a 50% drawdown and be fine. But mm -hmm. most of us, if we get close to retirement, we don't want to see a 50% drawdown. So we want to see less risk. And we'll, we'll talk about that some in my presentation. But yeah, yeah, more risk in the early years, less in the later years. All right. So um, we're going to go ahead and, um, oh, geez, you know, there's so many questions and I don't want to shortchange Chris's time. Um, I might take one or two more questions and, um, and then we're going to pivot to Chris's presentation and then come back to do Q&A on Chris's presentation as well as take general questions from the audience. So right and, now and we're- I'll, I'll try to be pithy, I'll, I'll be short. <laughs> I don't know, I mean, I'm no enjoying way. it. I don't have any plans, I'm not leaving the house. <laughs> Feel free to take up my yeah. entire evening. Um, <laughs> Terry Piot, and I'm, please pardon me if I mispronounce your name. What are your thoughts on small cap value, uh, small cap growth, you didn't say. Mm. Fun, uh, funds going forward. I fear total stock market index is too heavily growth cap weighted, which may underperform going forward. 20 to 30 year time horizon. I'm okay with volatility. Daryl, you've looked at these long-term growth versus value tables. You want to comment on that? Well, again, we only know what's happened in the past. Absolutely. And and if if the uh, if you go to the website and look under the four fund combo, we did a study that we looked at uh, returns from 1928 through 2019, and we looked at four asset classes, four four equity asset classes, the large and small growth and value it was all U.S. And there's kind of people are familiar with the Callan charts that show who which type of asset class performed best. If you look at that table, it looks at it in 10 year chunks and it shows how the four major asset classes performed overall for those 10 year periods, nine of those, those nine 10 year periods. And uh, small cap value does pretty well. Uh, small cap growth wasn't really in there. There was a small cap blend and to be honest, I don't recall how much of the blend is made up of growth versus value. Do you know, Paul? You know, I, 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 I don't, but I, but so, I think. Uh, so I think if, if you go and look at the, the four fund combo charts on Paul's site and, uh, and look at the article that he wrote about that and, and that uh, multiple multicolored chart, you can see how, uh, your, your your instinct is right in that the total market, which is basically the S and P 500, doesn't really uh, it doesn't always perform the best. Um, in fact, it's almost guaranteed to not always perform the best. 
That's not to say it doesn't perform best in some decades, and but not in others. And the, the thing that's surprising is that in the past, the small cap value has, has performed uh, in the top of those four asset classes uh, quite frequently. And when you get to the end, the returns sort out just like you would expect. Um, small cap values at the top and the large cap growth or the, the large cap blend is, uh, is at the bottom. It's a matter of fact. Those four, of those four, there are some, I think there are some. Okay, no, I'm no. I'm getting some feedback right yeah, now, and is I that think it's something I'm doing, or no, I don't think it's you. I think it's because we have a couple of people who aren't wearing headsets, and um, the audio is picking up that loop. So I'm going to temporarily, guys, uh, Daryl, Chris, could you go ahead and mute yourselves and unmute yeah. yourselves as Paul talks? Thank you, Paul. What were you going to add? Yeah, I was just going to say Daryl did uh, an amazing study I, in terms of educational impact. He looked at every decade going back to 30 through 39 and then all the way up till 2010 through 2019. And he looked at these at, at these major equity asset classes. And again, it did not include growth per se, but blend is mostly growth. You look at the S&P 500, the impact of those very, very large companies in a cap weighted portfolio make the growth the most impactful. When you look at the four fund strategy, its results not only were much better over the 90 year period, but they were kind of right in the middle and middle towards the top. They could never be at the top because the four fund strategy, the four assets can't ever be number one because one of the four asset classes is going to be number one more than likely. So what you have is a group that that produces really great returns in the middle. As, as Daryl said, S&P 500, sometimes right at the bottom, sometimes just one up from the bottom, sometimes two up from the bottom. Mm -hmm. But the four are so much more profitable. And every piece of evidence that I can see when you look at more than just a few years, if you go out 10 years, the four fund strategy is actually less risky. Very interesting. Um, there, I'm gonna take two more questions then we're gonna pivot to um, Chris's presentation. So Nikki had a quick question. What information on your website should I consult to determine what my distribution between equities and bonds should be? Is there a rule of thumb for specific ages? Oh, rule of thumbs. Uh, well, the, the page we have is called Fine Tuning. You go to Best Advice on our homepage. Yes. And you, there's a drop down box. Uh, and it's Fine Tuning. The Fine Tuning tables are built to help people find the right combination uh, that they should have. Mm -hmm. And what was the second part? There was another part. Is sorry. there is there a rule of thumb oh, for rule specific of thumb. ages? Well, you know, some of what I think that Chris will cover will, will, will touch on that. But here's a rule of thumb. Go to Vanguard. Go to <laughs> T. Rowe Price. They have a glide path. You can see what they think is the best glide path for somebody. And you could say, okay, I like their glad, the glide path being stocks and bonds. Mm -hmm. I like that glide path. I just like a different group of stocks or I like a different group of bonds. But there's your your rule of thumb. Learn from the best in the business. Well, you know, I'll, that's... I'll, I'll show the industry average in my presentation okay. too. So that'll even save you having to look. Absolutely. So I hope you'll stick around, Nikki. I know this is going to be a long day, but it's really worthwhile. And I don't want to let these guys go. But to add that note, when you're looking at the glide paths for all the different um, options out there, they all differ in the target date funds, if you will. And so um, Vanguard's glide path is not similar to T. Rowe Price or Fidelity. So that's what's so interesting is there no, there's no industry standard. All right, last question, and before we switch over to Chris's, and this is from Doug. What's the time horizon to see the gains in small cap value? Rick Ferry from an earlier Choose FI podcast said small cap value is a patient person's game and should have a small percentage of your portfolio. P.S. I'm doing your 90-10 ultimate buy and hold in a Roth and higher small cap uh, in my pre-tax. 
and it's cutting off the question based on averages of your multiple 401k recommendations. Uh, well, in the uh, 401k recommendations, uh, we we are bound by what the the companies have in their 401ks to to pick from. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know that uh, how much. I mean, if we could, we would put. I mean, IBM has all the asset classes available. Yeah, for their employees. So the recommendations we made at, at, at IBM were 10, 10, 10, 10. Everything, everybody got 10%. At age 76, I'm half in small cap. Wow. And my and that's by the way, that's I'm not all equities, I'm half in equities. So I'm conservative, half equities, half by and and half bonds. And then the equities are half big and half small basically half value and half growth, mm -hmm. and also half U.S. and half international. I am a man without a country <laughs> or a bias. They're all great asset classes. Mm -hmm. They tend to go up and down together. And, uh, and, and, and so it kind of has to do with our comfort level. Most people my age are not comfortable having 25% of their equities in small cap value. Hmm. But I am. Daryl, how much do you have in small cap value? In your equities. Oh, you're muted, hon. There I'm going to mute you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It. Go ahead. You're unmuted. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is embarrassing because, you know, I don't know. Okay. That's good. Um, actually. <laughs> part of it is, is that um, I set myself up. Um, I, I sort of cheat. I have part of my portfolio managed by an investment advisory firm that Paul's very familiar with. And part of it, I do myself. Mm -hmm. And so I set my own up probably 17 years ago or so. And I really haven't touched it since then, except to liquidate a bunch of bonds here a few years ago for something. Um, and the other half or the other part of it is, is with this other firm. And <laughs> And uh, I, you know, to be honest, I don't know what he's got in there, right? Well, I do know what he's got in there. I just don't know what the asset allocation is right now. Mm. Well, and, um, and I, I know it's pretty aggressive it. because it's all stock because all my fixed income is in my four hundred one k. But yeah, I am going to redirect back to the question he asked, which was specifically, what's the time horizon to see the gains in oh. small cap value? And I think that means that you have to put on your prognostication. Ah. Cap. But, Actually, I, I, I think I've got a tool for him. So if you go to IFA.com, Index, Index Fund Advisors, mm -hmm. uh, they have a whole bunch of charts. But one of the charts that they have will let you pick asset classes and compare the returns uh, over time. You can look at one year, five year, 10 year, 40 year. And if you go there and you use that tool, it'll tell you what the likelihood is, for example, that small cap value will beat the S&P 500 in one year, five year, 10 year, 20 year. So um, I think you can wait 20 years and still not win, right? I mean, it's a long time. It's a long uh, game. Yeah, I mean, by the time you're out to 20 years, it's like 1% of the time or something that, that you would not have beat the S&P 500. And by the time you get to 40 years, uh, at least in our data sets, it's zero. But um, yeah, go check out that tool. That'll let you answer the question in detail. Yeah. All right. It's also oh, on Chris. Paul's website with mm -hmm. the, under the four fund. Uh, what the heck? It's not four funds. What's it under, Paul? Do you remember? No, I don't. Uh, I I. While you're thinking yeah. of that, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, it's under what the heck is it under? I'll look for it, Daryl. Go ahead and complete your thought, and see if I'll see if I can find a ton. Well, the the uh, it has a chart on there, a series of charts actually, that that sort of give you an idea. When we went back and looked at the nine decades, um, and we look, and when you oh, look at the right, at you look at, whoa, at the ten ten chunks, ten year chunks. Yes. Small cap value one in one, two, three, four, five, six of those ten decades. Uh, at at um, let's see, what is this? These are. It, you, you know what it is, Daryl. It's it, it is under 
best advice at the bottom. I think it's the nine decades of yeah, performance. yeah, there it is. Okay, and and, and and in the fifteen year, I found it, and in the fifteen year periods, there were uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, fifteen year periods, and it won four of those six periods. All right, I'm sending that in. Right. And, and um, the twenty year periods, it won three out of four. So. Okay, so uh, I'm posting that right now into the group chat on Facebook. I have like four or five screens open right now. Bear with me, guys. And um, there we go. And I think this will help that gentleman out. Okay, so Chris, can you go ahead and load up your presentation and add it to the stream? I am going to hide all of us, and you will be the star of the show. And then we'll kinda, we're going to come back to answering everyone's questions again. So please stay with us. All right, so are you queuing them up? Chris? Okay. Getting and, there, getting there. All right. So I was muted. Yes, and, and uh, I'm I. My screen, but I need to go get the app. Can you see that? No, it's a complete blank. All right, let's come back here. Let's make sure that you've, um, this worked the other day. <laughs> yeah, you Bear with that. us, yeah. Um, and so uh, I, we've muted Daryl, but he's still with us. And Paul, his camera's off, but Paul's with us still too. So don't worry, yeah, guys. We're almost there, how's that? Um, yes, okay, that's showing. And it's going to display, and I'm going to have you on screen because I think it's so much fun. Go ahead and maximize your presentation and slide view. Uh, give me just a sec. Are you seeing presenter view right now? I am seeing your. Uh, well, I saw presenter views. Now we're on presentation view, and it's all good. Yes, we're good. Okay. Paul, Paul, can you see this? I can. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to leave you unmuted so you can chime in and you know. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about Chris. So Chris Pedersen is the chief, the director of research for the Merriman uh, Educational Financial Educational Financial Education Foundation. Pardon me, I'm just tripping over my words. I either need more coffee or less. And um, so his background is sort of interesting. He's an engineer by training, and he likes to find new opportunities. So he's enjoyed success in Silicon Valley as a product manager, a program manager, brand manager, startup founder, consultant, business development manager. He's probably basically uh, the jack of all trades, just like I'm the gen of all trades. His grandfather taught him to say, I am a financial wizard before he was two years old. But you know what's interesting? He was perverse enough to choose engineering instead. And, and now we've come full circle and he is back to finance. So, Mr. Wizard, <laughs> come on in. <laughs> Thank you very much. I <clears throat> appreciate that, Jenna. I, you know, I am super excited to talk to the fire group because I think of you guys as saving superstars. I, I, I dearly hope that my kids are excited by the idea of fire. Um, I, I would love it if they would pursue that. I think I'm an accidental member of the fire movement. And the reason for that is that I always expected I was going to work into my mid 60s. And uh, long before that time came, uh, there just wasn't an intersection between my interests and my employer's interests. And I found myself retiring early. Fortunately, my parents had scared me early in my life and told me I needed to save aggressively. And so it worked out fine. Um, and in a lot of respects, if I think back on how we managed our money, it was it was similar to what a, a fire person would do today. So I'm just delighted to talk to people here at Choose FI about, about um, how a very simple investing strategy might be part of your plan. But more than that, I just, I, I really, I am honored to be here because uh, it's such a privilege to talk to people who take preparing for their future seriously. So let's get started. Uh, we're going to talk about two funds for life in pre and post retirement. 
And uh, we're going to start by talking about one fund for life, the target date fund. Paul already introduced it a little bit. I'm going to go into just a little bit more detail because I realize for some of you, it may not be familiar. Um, and we're going to talk about you know, how it works, why it works, what it does, what it doesn't do. Then we're going to talk about how a second fund might help a young or retiring investor. Uh, but we'll talk about second funds and what role they can play. And then we'll talk about FIRE because the way we set up two funds for life is different than the way you would apply it if you are planning to retire early. And, and from there, we'll go on to talk about people who are approaching or are in retirement and how this same strategy might work for them. And then we'll finish up with some ideas about how to test your plan and how to stick with it and some loose ends and next steps. So what, what are uh, target date funds and why are they important? Target date funds are really, um, I think of them as robo advisors on the cheap or robo advisors for the masses, right? They aim to manage a broad, diverse portfolio of assets uh, for you for a very low cost and make it super easy to buy. Basically, you choose a year that's associated with when you think you're going to retire. Let's say you're going to retire in 2040. You would choose the, the Vanguard 2040 Target Retirement Fund and invest in that. And they are incredibly popular. There's over 1.7 trillion assets, a uh, trillion dollars of assets invested in target date funds. Uh, over 77% of people in 401k accounts hold at least one target date fund. And in accounts where Vanguard is the chosen fund, Vanguard says that 50% of people have 100% of their assets in their target date fund. And Vanguard, the lion's share of the market. They've got 37% market share. So whether you invest in a target date fund or not, you probably know somebody who does. And because I think many of you, since you're willing to spend some of your Saturday watching us talk about finance, might be influencers, it's good for you to know about them because people are going to ask you, well, you know, hey, I'm invested in a target date fund. What else could I or should I do? So let's talk a little bit about what they do um, and how they do it. So a, a target date fund uh, starts out with this premise that we all have human capital that we trade over time for money. So when we're 25 years old or just entering the workforce, we have maybe 40 years to work. We've got freshly minted skills. Uh, we have the ability to let compounding work for us for decades. And as we get older, we have fewer and fewer years to work, fewer and fewer years to let compounding work for us. And by the time we get near retirement, if, if we lost our net worth, it would be catastrophic because we, we would really struggle to, to earn it back. We wouldn't have those years to recover. But if we lost our net worth at 25, first of all, for most of us, that was zero anyway. Um, and then second of all, yeah, it's no big deal. I've got a long time to recover, right? So we can take more risk in these early years and less risk in the later years. And what target date funds do to recognize that is they shift from riskier equity assets to safer bond assets over time. And the cool thing about a target date fund is when you buy it, uh, you just pick the year you're going to retire out here. Uh, actually, 65 would be a traditional retirement. So this is where the curve would line up with your retirement year. And when you buy that single fund, you get this broadly diversified thing that looks a little bit like what Paul was describing in the Ultimate Buy and Hold portfolio. It's got large, it's got small, it's got mid, it's got US, it's got international, it's got emerging markets, it's got bonds, it's got tips, it's got, you know, it's just this very broadly diversified thing, all with a single purchase. Now, what it doesn't have that Paul described earlier is a tilt towards small or a tilt towards value. Um, so <clears throat> that's, that's a missing component, if you will, in terms of its diversification. And we'll talk about how you might want to deal with that in a minute. But when we first came to this problem or this opportunity of how to leverage target date funds, the first question was, does this glide path, this changing set of assets over time, do what it's supposed to do? What it's supposed to do is reduce risk, right? So 
we thought, well, we'll do a back test, right? Now, a back test is where you, like Paul was doing earlier, you go back in time and you, in, you, you say, I have this portfolio or I'm investing. What happens in 1970, 1971, 72? And you, you, know, you run through it and you find out how it performed. The problem here is that the asset allocation is changing with every year. So you really want to say, well, what happens if I'm 25 year old in 1970? And then what about a 26 year old and a 27 year old? And so it got kind of complicated, but we, we built a back tester that let you look at not just every month where you could have started, but also every age where you could have started. So you saw all of the different experiences somebody might have had and to take advantage of uh, or to compensate for the fact that we didn't have that much history. When we got to 19 uh, or to 2017, which was the end of the data when we did this analysis, we looped back to the beginning. So we went from 2017 back to 1970. It's a it's something that is often done in these kinds of tests. It's called circular bootstrapping. And what we saw then when we looked at the risk uh, was this chart here. So this is showing across any, you know, all of those years to average together where you could have started in 1970, 71, 72. In fact, we did it month by month. What was the worst drawdown you would have seen if you're a lump sum investor uh, at age 25, age 26, 27, you know, just right through the chart. And the top of this chart is the worst you would have experienced through your entire investing experience. And this black line at the bottom is what you might have seen as a drawdown every quarter. You, so every quarter you kind of expect that, you know, using a Vanguard like target date fund, you're going to see a drawdown of 5% ish, three to 5%, something like that. Um, Every year, you should probably see a drawdown, eh, 10 to 15, maybe even 20%, right? So somewhere in this range. Uh, and then, you know, all the way at the top, you have this worst case. And it looks like it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. It starts out with this really high risk early on. It stays steady until you're about 40 when, you know, your, your human capital starts to decline rapidly. And it tapers off to 65. But there's a problem. I don't know about you. But I didn't start at age 25 with a lump sum investment that was really big. Um, you know, I I had wonderful parents who set me up with you know help for education and stuff. But I started out like most people with a zero balance in my account, and I had to contribute on a regular basis. So what happens if you do that kind of an investment strategy instead of a lump sum investment? And here's what it looks like if you do monthly investing of the same amount and you increase it with inflation over time. And whoa, it's totally different, right? Um, now, you actually have less risk at age 26 than you're going to have at age 65, which is kind of amazing when you think about it, right? Um, and that risk doesn't peak until you get out to about age 40. So why would that be? Well, the answer is the contributions, right? Let's say you start out in uh, January, January zero, January one, you've got uh, $0 in your account, you contribute $1,000 and a month later, the market is off 10%. Well, if you look right at the end of the month, you're gonna say, well, I'm down 10%, but then you contribute 100% of the value of your account in February, right? Another $1,000. And you're going to look in your account and go, I'm up, right? So the market's down, but I'm up. And that is the experience that young investors have. Um, Paul has told me he's had many experiences in the past when the market's down and people are freaking out. And he talks to young investors who are in this, you know, this early part of their curve saying, well, the market's down, but I'm not down, right? I'm up. I'm doing well. And you can see that if we if we chart just one asset class with these two investment strategies. So these are the drawdowns that you would have experienced investing in uh, a, a fairly volatile, all small cap value portfolio, right? Starting in 1972. And if you do it with a lump sum investment, pretty quickly, you get off to a very deep drawdown. You're down, uh, this is like 40%, right? So pretty significant drawdown. But if you're investing with monthly contributions, you're only seeing about a 10% drawdown. 
Now, in these early years, that's where that really makes a big difference. It, it, it counts for a lot. But in these later years, those two graphs overlap one another. You know, by the time you get out to 20 years, it's not really helping very much. So when I think of this, I think about if we go back a few slides, remember this is the industry average standard glide path. It has a lot of fixed income in here. The Vanguard target date funds have 10% of fixed income in the years from 25 to 35, actually all the way out to 40. And when I think about putting bonds in those early portfolios, um, this is what I think of. It's like taking a track athlete who's all ready to run the race and putting extra protection on their feet, giving them boots. They don't need the boots. They, you know, they're protected in so many other ways um, and it's just gonna slow them down. It's gonna hold them up. So we looked at this and said, how could you improve? How might we do better? And the first thought was, why not just take uh, a portion of what you would be saving towards retirement and put it into a separate account. Don't even worry about balancing, about rebalancing on an annual basis. Just let it ride. And we did that because we thought it was easy and something that almost anybody could do um, because you could, you might not have small cap value available to you in your 401k or your IRA, but you might be able to set up a, sec sep uh, a second account where you could. And so then we looked at what impact that would have, just moving 10% over. And so what you see here on the first column is what you would have historically gotten with a Vanguard-like allocation. Um, it's regularly rebalanced because the contributions going in are managed by the fund to hit a target allocation. And the median end balance would have been 7.93 million the lowest you would have gotten in all of those histories we looked at was 3.49 million and the highest was 12.8. Well, just by adding the 10% small cap value or shifting, I should say, shifting away 10% into small cap value, the median went up by um, well over a million dollars. It goes from almost eight to over 10, right? 7.93 to 10.31. Um, and the worst case got better, right? So as long as you can stick with it and you can be in it and be consistent, the worst case got better and the best case got much better. Now there is a cost, there's always a cost, right? And that cost is down here in the drawdowns. So you go from with a Vanguard like worst case drawdown of 46% to 48%. Well, that's, that's not too bad. I think most of us would take a 2% increase in the worst drawdown for an extra million dollars at the end of the experience. Um, but if you look down here at the bottom, that, that uh, very end where you're getting near retirement is starting to creep up a little bit. And if you take 20% into small cap value, it creeps up even more. And if you take 30% into small cap value, it's basically flat, right? You've basically gotten into something where you're mostly, if not, you know, dominated by small cap value out here. Uh, and you're kind of a single fund solution because it outgrew your target date fund and you have a high risk going into retirement. Um, I should also say that these are all based on this assumption that somebody would invest $10,000 per year increasing with inflation. And if that's too much and you want to invest $5,000 per year increasing with inflation, divide by two. If you want to invest $1,000 per year increasing in uh, with inflation, divide by 10. So you can adjust it. But this begged the question, how could we kind of have our cake and eat it too? We'd like to have more, more return. We're okay with maybe a little bit more risk, but we don't want it to be there at the end. So what could we do? And what we came up with was this idea that we would we would scale the second fund with age. So the second, what you do is you take 1.5 times your age, and that becomes the percentage that you're going to put in the target date fund. And then the rest you're going to put into either large cap value, small cap, a mix of large cap value and small cap value, small cap value. Um, and and I'll talk about this other one at the end uh, later. So ignore that far right hand column. And now what you see, if we, if we just go down to the risk chart down at the bottom is that we are getting a little more risk in the middle of the curve where we can tolerate it, but these all taper off as you go to the right. 
So as you go to the right and you get close to retirement age, the risk is coming down, which is exactly what we want. But did we still get the benefit? Well, we started out, remember, at right around $8 million was the median end balance. Well, if, if you do the 1.5 times age and you put it into large cap value, it goes up to 10. So how would that work? Well, you would, let's say you're age 30, 1.5 times 30 is 45. So you would put 45% at age 30 in the target date fund and the 55% would go into large cap value. And just by shifting, you know, that time varying asset over the life of this investment process, you go from 8 million to again, roughly 10 million. And if we go all the way over to small cap value, um, you go up to 11.5 million. And the worst case in all of these scenarios down here at the bottom gets better. It doesn't get worse. So it seems like a prudent thing to do. Um, and if you really, really want to get aggressive over on the far right, you can take 2.5 times your age minus 25. And you put that as a percentage in the target date fund. That basically means that when you're 40 years from retirement, you're 100% in small cap value and at retirement, you're 100% in the target date fund. Um, you've got to believe a lot in small cap value and be patient to do that, but it's in there just so you can see what it would do. So what's the catch, right? I mean, this looks like free money. And the catch is, it's a lot like navigating with, uh, with Google Maps. When you go into Google Maps uh, and you pull up a route, whether it's a short route or a long route, it gives you a pretty good estimate. There's no guarantee, but it gives you a pretty good estimate of how long it's going to take you to get where you're going. And in fact, the longer the route on a percentage basis, the more accurate it probably is. But the thing it presumes, and we all know this because a lot of us have done this, is that you stick to the route and that if it, if it gives you some instructions to change, that you continue to follow your plan, you stick to your route. Um, if you deviate from your route, you know, say you get, uh, you know, partway down this preferred road and then you second guess and you cut across to the other road and then partway up there, you second guess and you come across to this other road, I can almost guarantee you it's going to take you much longer to get to the end destination. And that's even more true for a long journey, right? So uh, the catch here is you have to be disciplined. You have to stick with your plan. You have to pick your plan. You have to pick a plan you can believe in and you have to stick with it. So now let's talk a little bit about FIRE. Like how would I apply that if I'm planning to retire early? Because those multipliers were all kind of built around this idea that you know my age is gonna get me to 65 and that's where I will retire and that's when I'll be all in the target date fund. So. If you want to apply this as somebody who's planning to retire early, you kind of flip it around, right? So instead of taking 1.5 times your age, you take 1.5 times the years to retirement and you put that in the second fund. And then you put the rest in the target date fund. So how would it work? Let's say you're 30 years old and you're planning to retire at age 50. So you're going to save very aggressively and you're going to retire early. Well, you have 20 years left until retirement. So 20 times 1.5 is 30. You would put that 30% in the second fund and you would put the 70% in the target date fund. And I, I can't see your questions, but I'm pretty sure somebody's hand is up now and they're saying, well, okay, cool. How much of a difference is it gonna make? And unfortunately, this is a complicated question to answer. It would take a series of tables because, um, you know, some people want to retire in 20 years. Some people want to retire in 25 years. Some people want to reti retire in 40 years. And I haven't created, you know, a very complex uh, two-dimensional set of tables to answer that question yet. What I can tell you though, is that the same principles that apply to make it work for somebody who is planning on retiring in 40 years would work for somebody who's planning on retiring in 20, but they won't work quite as dramatically, right? The longer you have to let a portfolio play out, the more its differences are gonna matter or the more its, uh, you know, its return is going to matter even, you know, just as basic as that. So, um, it won't matter as much if you're not using it as long, but the changes should still, the, the, the princi 
samples are sound, they should still help. Um, and then, you know, there's the obvious disclaimer, there are no guarantees. You could pursue this strategy for five years, 10 years, 15 years, and still underperform the S&P 500. Um, one of my favorite quotes in investing, and I can't remember who said it, is that markets can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. So it's quite possible that strange things happen, and I can't predict those, you can't predict those, but all of the history suggests that these are good strategies to apply, even if you're planning to retire early. So um, now what if I'm really planning to retire early, like tomorrow, right? What if I'm on the verge of retirement? Uh, does that mean this two fund for life strategy doesn't help me at all, right? That was the question I spent most of 2019 hearing is uh, what, you know, you left me out, what do I do? And so the, the answer here is it depends. And it primarily depends on whether you've undersaved, oversaved, or have saved just the right amount. So how do we know? How do we know which of those three is right? And I'm gonna recommend that we start with the 4% rule. Um, I have tested the 4% rule. A lot of other people have tested the 4% rule. Uh, it still holds up quite well, even with recent market histories. If you wanna be more conservative because you're planning to retire early and you want your money to last longer, maybe you use a 3.5% rule or a 3% rule. And we'll look at actually some data to show why you might wanna do that. But the 4% rule, I still think for most people is a prudent starting place. So the way this works is you start over on the right hand side and you figure out what it costs you to live the lifestyle you want to live. And then you look at how much money you have coming in from other sources, social security, pension, uh, maybe you have an annuity, right? Whatever it is. And you subtract that out of your expenses to figure out how much you're going to draw out of your nest egg every year, right? Now these things all interact. So you could run through that scenario and come over here and say, well, I need to withdraw 5% every year. And according to this chart, that means I've undersaved. You can come back over here and look at your expenses and say, well, you know, I don't really need to make four vacations a year, I can live on two vacations a year. I have no idea what's in your expenses, right? But, um, you know, maybe it's less avocado toast. I have, I have no idea, but they interact, right? So you, you could also come over here and you could say, well, you know, my expenses came out at 4% per year, um, but I actually want to, you know, live under that. And so you can lower your expenses. Um, it's hard to raise the additional income late in life. Um, but once you've settled on a plan and you've got an idea of whether you have undersaved, saved just right, or oversaved, then you can start to figure out what that means for you in terms of two funds for life. So if your total withdrawals on an annual basis, and those are going to increase with inflation, so you just look at the beginning, right? If your total withdrawals on an annual basis are greater than 4% per year, I'm gonna say you've undersaved. Uh, if they're right at 4% per year, I'd say you, congratulations, you know, you're one of the lucky ones. You did just well, just well enough. And if it's less than 4% per year, hooray, you know, you have oversaved. That's awesome. You have choices and options. So if your withdrawal rate is greater than 4% per year, I'm going to say go see a financial planner. Um, and I know that the first reaction for a lot of people is going to be, wait a minute, doesn't that cost money? You know, I, I don't, I, you know, I'm trying to be prudent and I don't, I, you know, I have too little money, but it will be money well spent. Um, we saw a financial planner as I appro approached retirement, as we approached retirement, and it was incredibly powerful. Um, you know, did we pay too much? Maybe, I, you know, probably, but did we get way more value than what we paid? Absolutely. It gave us the peace of mind in this really significant transition that was very important. Um, so for people who have undersaved, I'd say see a financial planner. There will be no boilerplate answer that you find in my slides or Paul's or anybody else's that really solves the problem for you. Don't lose hope though. I mean, there, there will be a solution. I don't know what it is, but there'll be something and go see a financial planner and figure it out. If your withdrawal rate is right around 4%, 100% target date fund is what two funds for life got you to. And it's 
probably fine as you enter retirement. It's kind of what it was designed for, right? It's prudent. Uh, the, the whole design of target date funds is to help people not run out of money. And so it, it's fine, you know, right at retirement, it, it's not a bad place to be. And if your withdrawal rate is less than 4% per year and you've oversaved, you've got choices. So you could spend more to drive it up to 4% or you could be charitable every year to drive it up to 4% or you could say, you know what? I have extra money that I wanna pass on either to charities when I die or to, uh, you know, as a legacy to my children. And really that's for a next generation. It's like an extra bucket. You can invest that more aggressively. So um, if you've been paying attention, you're kind of hearing something contradictory here. You're, you're, you're hearing that, wait a minute. He said, I start out with two funds and then it ramps down to just the target date fund. And now if I've oversaved in retirement, I can take on a second fund again, right? Like, like what's up here? Well, the reason it sounds that way and the reason I'm happy with people arriving at retirement with just the target date fund is that it's fairly conservative. And this is a nervous time. Um, you know, I think of, of myself as fairly calm when it comes to investing, calm under stress, and my wife is too. We hadn't been retired six months when my wife came to me looking a little bit like this picture in the top left corner and said, where's the money going to come from? Right. There were no more paychecks. Uh, it felt really insecure because we had never lived off of the nest egg that we had built up. And so being a little extra conservative right at that moment is not a bad thing. Um, I think even for people who've saved just the right amount, it's okay to take on more risk once they get through that. And for some people, maybe they're not nervous and it's fine and they can take on more risk even at that moment. But um, if you've followed two funds to, for life to retirement and you find that you're all in the target date fund and you just wanna stay there for a sense of security for that first year of retirement, go for it. You know, it's, it's gonna be stable and I think it'll help mitigate some of that stress. So I want to step out of category for just a moment, out of the world of finance and have you think about uh, a challenge that NASA has and then relate it back to our portfolios and how we drive them, especially in retirement. Uh, when NASA is driving the rover on Mars, they do, it's not like a remote control car. They don't get to just sit there and look out the window and steer left and right. And the reason is that Mars is between three and 22 light minutes away from Earth. So if they were trying to do it that way, it would be like trying to drive your car with a tape delay on the window screen where you can only see what happened 20 minutes ago, right? It just wouldn't work. You would crash. You would crash in a heartbeat. So every day they're getting ready to send instructions up to the Mars rover. They have to figure out how they do that so that they don't crash this multi-billion dollar asset that's sitting on Mars. And it's really important. So they have this motto that's called test as you fly and fly as you test. And what they do, I think this is really a, a phenomenal thing, is they have a rover here on Earth and they take all the instructions that they're gonna send to the rover on Mars and they run them here on Earth on terrain that's as close as they can create to what the Mars rover is seeing on Mars. And you don't mess with that plan before you send it to the rover on Mars because that, that would be freelancing or, you know, kind of, you know, trying to, trying to be a cowboy. That's the way you crash the rover on Mars. That would be bad. Well, our portfolios are the same way, right? When we make a change on our portfolio, we don't really see the impact for maybe five years, 10 years, 15 years. So how do you drive the portfolio like a sports car? You can't, right? In, in fact, if you ever think you're making a change to your portfolio based on something you heard recently to get a result soon, that's probably a sign you should like drop, you know, step away from the keyboard. Our portfolios aren't sports cars. They're more like the Rover on Mars. It takes a long time for our instructions to play out. So how can we apply this test as you fly and fly as you test thing? Well, it turns out there's a really cool tool. And this tool is at PortfolioVisualizer.com. When you go to their website, this is a free tool. It's a free website, unless you want their premium features and you won't need it for this. You can go to the financial goals. It's highlighted here. 
And in financial goals, you can create a multi-stage plan type. And that lets you, especially as you're approaching retirement with something like a target date fund that has these nice straight lines of what's happening in terms of the asset allocation, you can set the asset allocation to match what you have at age 55. And then when the, the allocation finishes its straight line uh, out to like age 70 or 72, you can put that in and you can put in when you want to start taking out money and what percentage you want to take out and how much money you're starting with. Um, it's really just, it's this awesome tool. It's, it lets us do what they do with the Mars Rover. It lets you test either the plan that you have or the plan that you're thinking of changing to before you change to it and set your expectations, right? So let's not crash our, crash our portfolio Rover, if you will. And um, I know this is a really busy slide. I apologize for that, but there's just a few things I want you to see on it. This is what Portfolio Visualizer spits out. These are all portfolios that started a million dollars, a million there, a million there, a million there. The one on the left is a 3% fixed withdrawal rate. The one in the middle is a 4% fixed withdrawal rate. And the one on the right is a 5% fixed withdrawal rate. And in all of these cases, that means that uh, you start out with say 3% of the portfolio and you increase it with inflation every year so that you have the same buying power. <clears throat> and what you see is that um, the three percent fixed withdrawal rate kind of lasts forever at least in terms of this chart it goes out to 35 and even more significant it's it's almost always growing there's only this worst case line at the bottom that is declining so three percent is quite safe and that's why i said if you want to be an early retiree who's thinking maybe you'll be retired for 50 years or 60 years right uh, at 3% is going to be super conservative. You can go run the numbers on 3.5 and it'll be between the three and the four. The reason I said I still think four is safe is that there's only one line on this chart. It's this bottom line uh, that doesn't make it out to 35 years. And most people are not going to be retired for 35 years, right? And most of the other lines make it well past 35 years. So, um, you know, it it's a higher withdrawal rate, you spend more money, you end up with less balance. So it's zero to 2.7 million instead of 0.8 to 4.3 million. But most people are gonna make it. So that's why 4% is safe. 5% kind of dangerous, right? Only 34% of the curves make it all the way out to 35 years. So that's why 5% as a fixed withdrawal rate is not recommended. Now you can follow this link I have up here and there's one on every page and go get to a starting point example if you want and then start messing around with the numbers. So um, hopefully I'm teaching you guys how to fish and you can do this on your own and learn some interesting things about your portfolio. Uh, I'm going to skip the variable withdrawals right now. I mean, just safe to say that a variable withdrawal never goes to zero because you're always taking out a variable amount. Um, uh, the one thing to watch on variable withdrawals is that the value of what you take out may decline with time. So you can still take out 5%, but it might, might not buy the same amount that you could buy in the early years with that same 5%. So now let's look at how this two fund for life thing would work uh, for an over saver, right? So let's say that it's somebody who can live on $30,000 a year but they have enough money that they could take out $40,000 a year, right? So they've got a million dollars saved. They can live on $30,000 a year. They could put it all in the target date fund, but they could also say, you know what? 25% of my money, that gap between the 30,000 and the 40,000. So 25% of my portfolio is really for somebody else. It's, it's for something at the end of my life. Um, you can be more aggressive with that. You could put that 25% into large cap value or into small cap value. And what you see is that, uh, first of all, because it's a 3% withdrawal rate, uh, the early fund is never going to run out of money, right? But the all target date fund allocation gets you to 0 0.8 million to 4.3 million. Just by taking that 25% to large cap value, you go to 0.9 million to 8.4 million. It almost doubles what you end up with at age 35. 
And if you go to small cap value, you historically, again, this is data not guaranteed, but it's what happened in the past, you tripled, practically tripled the money that you might have ended up with on the high end and the low end doubled. So the median is somewhere in between, right? Um, so it's a really powerful strategy. And for somebody who is a fire retiree, who's going to have a long retirement, this is extra important because you've got the years for those factors and that added equity allocation to, to work for you and make the difference, right? So hopefully you see value in that. And again, if you wanna go start playing with these, there's a starting point URL here to, to go click on and, and uh, get you going. Now for a just enough saver, I said you could start out in the target date fund, right? But what happens if somebody has just enough saved and they decide over time that they can take a little more risk by shifting 10% into small cap value or 20% into small cap value? And this you know, could have been another equity fund. I just chose those for illustration. Well, the first thing you might think is, well, this is a just enough saver. Maybe the probability of them running out of money goes up. Well. The volatility goes up for sure, but this bottom curve down here, the, the number of times you run out of money hasn't really changed much. And it doesn't even change much with a 20% allocation. So you do increase your earning potential even by you know a small shift here or a larger shift. Uh, so for somebody who wants the, I think of it kind of as training wheels on right at retirement by leaving it all in the conservative target date fund, and then decides to get more aggressive. Um, by going and modeling this at portfoliovisualizer.com, you could consider the change for yourself, you know, based on your withdrawal rates, your allocations, everything else. Um, but the models suggest it's it's a pretty good, pretty good idea, even for somebody who has saved just enough. So I've got a few loose ends just to hit here quickly. So um, these are questions that often come up, and I just wanted to anticipate them and answer them. Uh, the first one is usually which fund should I use? I noticed somebody earlier had asked in the question thread uh, which mutual funds work. There isn't a mutual fund for target date funds. They're usually ETFs, um, but you can find those at, or I'm sorry, I said that backwards. There are mutual funds, target retirement funds for Vanguard that are mutual funds, easy to find. And you can find a recommended list of Vanguard mutual funds for all of the asset classes I talked about, as well as Vanguard, uh, Schwab, Fidelity, best in class uh, ETFs on Paul's website. So if you want individual fund recommendations, they're on the website. Uh, second question, could I use more funds to get more diversification? Sure, absolutely. Um, if you look at this carefully, you'll notice that in the early years, you're shifting your portfolio heavily towards the United States because you're in one fund and it's a US fund. If you wanna be more balanced and not have that concentrated risk, use a second fund that's international, works great. Uh, can I use Portfolio Visualizer to model target date funds in the contribution years? Not yet. I keep challenging uh, Tuomo Lapinen, who runs Portfolio Visualizer to add that. Uh, but it's not there yet. Uh, what's the biggest risk with this strategy? By far and away, portfolio suicide. So losing hope and selling when the market's down will take all of uh, it, all bets are off. If you can't if you can't stand the heat, um, you know, on these strategies, figure out a strategy that you can stand. Right, you have to stick with whatever it is that you're you're committed to. Uh, and then finally, what if I don't care about complexity and I want the ultimate target date fund? Well, Paul and I created a calculator. It's available on his website with a custom glide path that compensates for some of the other failings I mentioned. It uh, tilts a little bit more towards value, a little bit more towards small, but still maintains broad asset class diversification in the early years. And then you know does a similar kind of glide path to what we just talked about towards the end. So you can go find that at uh, Paul's website. Quick call to action. Uh, first of all, recognize the resilience of young por portfolios. Uh, young people have not just time on their side, but they have dollar cost averaging on their side. And it's their ability to take risk, You know, whether that's you personally or somebody you're helping, is really important to realize. 
uh, and encourage them to you know recognize that when the market's down like it has been recently it's on sale it's a you know it's a party for them it's great you know they're getting to buy things on the cheap uh, second consider two funds for life both in your work you know in your working years and also as you approach retirement uh, and as you approach retirement calculate your withdrawal rate and finally you know use tools to test your plan set expectations and then stick with it and that's pretty much it i have some helpful links and with that um, hopefully we're we're still live here and jennifer's going to say something to let me know it's all okay yeah we're still here with you in fact we still have over 150 160 people here oh my goodness. and so for those people that are still sticking around i just want to let you know this is well worth it and um and i'm bringing back all the guys and uh to answer questions and we have a plethora of them so let me uh disable the video on the presentation and do a little magic screen here and we're back okay cool. so a ton of people are still with us and by the way every time you said for the young i groaned i'm like how about for us older folks <laughs> but um okay so we have some great questions chris and your research one i want to let you know you validated everything that i had decided to do for my portfolio at my last employers because they had a really not ideal and i'm being very euphemistic here uh selection of funds and so i had just resigned myself to doing a two fund for life strategy but i didn't have a name for it. i'm like this is what it looks like this is how i'm going to make it work in portfolio visualizer i'm going to choose this and then you released and published your research and i went oh yes cool. <laughs> thank you for giving me peace of awesome. mind uh, because sometimes you know you're swimming along all by yourself. So yep. um, we have a ton of really great questions. One, I want to go back to Doug real quick and make sure he saw this comment. Doug, you had asked earlier about K through 12 curriculum, and had asked Paul if he'd be willing to teach. Um, he sounded like that's outside of his uh, purview and his ability to support right now. But just so that you know, we have free K through 12 curriculum. Here's the link for it. I hope that helps you and anyone else who's interested. Additionally, uh, we have tons of questions. So um, let's take a look at Ian Carr's question. Do you have any scenarios where we can see the returns of large cap value, uh, large cap growth in the mix? Large cap growth seems to be up when small cap value is down and vice versa, like now, uh, blah, blah, blah. If you even held 10% of your portfolio and rebounds when large cap growth was up more, would that yield any better returns? That is, if you rebounced in the early 90s, you could have captured the large cap growth and be um, and bought when small cap value wasn't uh, doing as well. And it would be a similar situation in the current market. You know, the large, the large cap blend category does include a lot of large cap growth. Mm -hmm. The reason I, I think, and Daryl and Paul may have a different answer on this, but the reason I don't think we focus on growth very much is that, it doesn't have a history of delivering above its weight, right? It tends to be expensive. It tends to be uh, volatile. It you know because it gets uh, it it gets inflated by enthusiasm, right? It gets mm. inflated by the enthusiasm of the the market, and so um, uh, you know having some of it through the blend asset classes that we have, I think, is prudent. But uh, I've I've never read an article, in fact, I've read a lot of articles that say avoid small cap growth, that the benefits of small cap value are as much because you avoid small cap growth as that, you know, as that you've gravitated towards small cap value, because small cap growth is even worse. Small cap growth is companies that tend to be, uh, you know, very hyped up and small and are selling um, entirely on the promise of a future that they haven't yet demonstrated. And so there's a lot of opportunity to lose money in small cap growth. Okay. Um, this, uh, this actual comment actually floated outside of our screen because um, the way our API works, the software that we use to connect to Facebook, it actually starts driving comments off the screen. But Bill Yon had asked, could you talk a little bit about the differences between um, a total stock market fund like VTSAX versus Vanguard's total world stock index fund, uh, VTWAX. If you were going to choose one and to construct something similar to this, any thoughts about one versus the other? Yeah, I don't, 
I think one of those is U.S. and one of them is worldwide, right? Yeah, that's so, correct. VTSA so, is total stock market U.S. Yeah, so the worldwide one is going to be, uh, it's not going to have the concentrated country risk. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be more diversified in that sense. And if you're the kind of person who looks back at history and says, you know what, Japan went to near zero, Russia went to zero, China went to zero, maybe the U.S. could go to zero. Right. If you're the kind of person who doesn't want that concentrated risk, a worldwide strategy is more prudent. Mm -hmm. Now, recent history says you do better in the U.S., but that's just recent history. Right. If you go back yeah. over decades, um, I, I, there was a really nice study done last year that showed that it's kind of a coin flip in the decades of the last century, whether the U.S. was better than worldwide or vice versa. So, um, it, you know, it's. Hard, there, I don't know an academic reason why the U.S. would be the best necessarily moving forward. Recently, it's been kind of expensive. I'm not a market timer, but you know, it really is. Do you do you want that concentrated risk or not? Well, and I think some of the concerns about bringing in uh, much more uh, concentrated international is then you have some currency risk too, depending on which countries are represented in the funds. And this is a world. Uh, stock index fund, so I'm not as concerned, but again, not a pundit or an expert here. Okay, so- But, but we, Jen, you've got yeah. to remember that we are talking about cap-weighted funds. That's true. Which means we are going to be driven by a large growth at, in both the U.S. total and mm -hmm. the global total. Mm -hmm. and, and as I think Chris said, maybe it was Daryl, the the long-term impact of growth why is it that growth does not offer a better long-term return even large cap growth and one reason may be that I, chris i think you said people pay up yeah they pay too much this is what yeah. happened in the late 90s people were willing to pay anything uh, in order to own some piece of the future of these companies and then when they disappoint and they all disappoint you know contrary to common belief the longer you hold an individual company the greater the probability of failure a lot of people think that that in order to get the best return you you, you have to hold it for the very long term mm -hmm. well let's think about sears let's think about general motors uh you think about a, a lot of very fine companies that came to a point in their existence that it 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 did not offer that glimmer and all of a sudden something that's very very popular gets not only do they lose some of their financial strength but people aren't willing to pay at the level of pe ratio that they were before when those were hot companies what would it, you add daryl i can see it in your eyes here you got something you want to add don't forget to unmute no. yourself daryl I, I had something I wanted to add though. Um, sure. Emotionally, there's something I really like about both of those funds, and that's that it, it always gives you the chance to say, oh, I own some of that, right? <laughs> so, Wait, you know, a dinner when party? You're at party and Tony <laughs> says, you know, oh man, I, I'm so excited about XYZ and I just, you know, made all this money on it. You go, oh yeah, yeah, I got some of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, you crack me up. Daryl, how about you? No, I think I think those two guys said said pretty okay. much everything that I would say. Um, All right, we've got some others. Um, let's see, uh, McGregor Magruder, who is actually I think joining us from Malaysia. I could be wrong. Uh, so they appreciate the team here. It seems that by default we all want to make investing so complicated that we then can't really implement it efficiently or effectively. I'm thankful to be learning about the simplifications here that I can even be teaching my children about from ten to four to maybe even two funds now, should the goal for young people be to start with two funds for life concept, then move up to four funds and eventually 10 funds plus bonds, or just stick with the two funds for life? Sounds like a dumb question, but it's marketing for impact or uh, truly for life. You wanna take it? Yeah. Chris? Uh, yeah, I'll take, sure, I'll take a shot and then you can add if, you, if I mess up, but... Um, uh, I, I think it's far more, the, the number of funds is far less important than that it work for you, right? So mm -hmm. uh, if it. you can if you can invest in a two fund strategy, believe in it, 
and be committed to it, there's there's nothing wrong with that. Um, if if for you, you know if as you go along you start to think you know I'd rather have more control, more tilt, and you want to change, that's fine too. But what you want to avoid is uh, switching on the fly, especially because of performance, right? Because yeah. as soon as you start chasing performance, essentially you're going to be selling low and buying high, right? And that's going to kill your returns. So absolutely, but, but, yeah. I, I I do I I do think that uh, having the four fund strategy, uh, it's going to give you half of your equity portfolio uh, being exposed to both small and value, some large value and some small value. I think that has a, a long term advantage. We haven't done all the testing of these over a lifetime. But uh, I would love to see. I do believe that I met, over the years I met people who owned a part of uh, shares of a company for a lifetime. Like one lady, her father was a officer with AIG, and so she had this holding of AIG, and there was no way she was going to sell it because it was something you should hold for a lifetime. Now. What if you used the four fund strategy uh, for the equity portion of your portfolio and you really felt comfortable? You went through bear markets and bull markets and markets that value was better and market that growth was better. And over a long period of time, you really feel comfortable with that spectrum of asset classes. Well, then you end up like I am at 76 not i'm i'm relaxed i feel peace of mind over having half my money in small because i've been doing it for a long time mm -hmm. and so there is something to be said i think for that stuff that daryl's working on the the small value big all that combination with the four funds yeah but but you know who likes it better than two i mean two <laughs> no two is really is, is so sweet it's so simple it is. And in fact, there's a question that's even later down in the feed that actually talks about why would you choose a four fund portfolio over two? And I was just thinking that's purely for simplicity. The trade offs are minor. Would you say that that's accurate? Well, if you choose the four fund, you've got control. You're, you're, first of all, you're, you're probably choosing five at least because yeah. you've got your four equity funds and then you're going to choose some fixed income, right? Mm -hmm. And, but now you have control that you didn't have the other way right trying to control your fixed income ratio fixed income to equity ratio when you're uh, working with a target date fund is kind of tricky but you know so you got more i think you have more control you do and i think it, it all depends then on whether or not the person who's interested in this is wants to hold and and manage that granularity of detail and not that mm -hmm. that four yeah. funds is necessarily all that much more uh complex but there adds. There's. There comes a point when maybe our cognitive function isn't going to, to be as sharp, and we won't want to manage our our portfolio as active, you know, in our own fashion and DIY it. So mm -hmm. um, I thought, Ryan. I hope that answered your question. That's Ryan Getchis. And um, back to the other questions that I saw in the field. By the way, we also had people say great information, Chris. Thank you so much. And I'll show those later because you know, kudos are always important. Um, John uh, Gorzinski asked, what percentage of portfolio should be in international funds? Shall we just refer him to back to those charts at the, uh, that you have for the fine tuning portfolio charts that you have on your site, Paul? I think that's fine. Um, we have, though, been willing to compromise. We were 50-50 US international. Mm -hmm. That's too much international for a lot of people. The, the, the home bias is a strong draw. Mm -hmm. And and we didn't want to discourage people from not trying something. So thirty percent international is, is is okay because if if you look at the long term return, you get about I don't remember exactly maybe a half a percent extra return by adding the internationals. Uh, no, as a matter of fact, Daryl. Now when you think about the fine. The ultimate buy and hold table when you get out to where you've added the internationals you get about yeah. six tenths of one percent yeah it's not insignificant um but 
again, it comes down to, to how much people are comfortable with. It kind of goes back to the two, four, or 10 funds. Mm -hmm. I think part of that, that whole, you know, the, I've forgotten who said it, but the best investment strategy of all is one you can actually execute. Yeah, and stick and, with and, it. And, and stick with it, and, you know, and bailing, as Chris mentioned, bailing in the middle and going to something else because all of a sudden it's just got too much to handle is can be counterproductive. And, uh, and so it's important to do that. Same thing probably with your international versus US uh, ratios, don't you think, Paul? Yeah, I, I, I do. And I think for full disclosure, um, I don't manage my own money. Uh, I don't have any interest in managing my own money. I have a life. <laughs> I love being, I mean, this is a Saturday afternoon. I'm looking out here at Puget Sound and the, and the snow-capped mountains. You know, it's, I love being right here. And, uh, and people think, oh, that must mean you, 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 you love the stock market. No, I hate the stock market. I, <laughs> I, I don't think, I think uh, uh, if, if I thought about it, all the bad things the stock market does to people, a lot of good things too, by the way, a lot of good things. You know, I just, this is the way I think I need to go through my life to have peace of mind and a piece of the action. And I don't want to be any more involved than I have to. Daryl, you mentioned that you manage. The means, the means up, to an end. It means to an end. And Chris, you're a complete yeah. do it yourselfer, right? I was muted. That's right. Oh, yeah. but, but, but keep in mind, he's younger. He may yeah, come he's around. He's really young. He's <laughs> just a kid. Oh, only with you guys do I ever feel like a young whippersnapper. Well, but, um, good, for you. good for you. But I would have to say, Paul that and I are graybeards. <laughs> well, and there are reasons to have um, your investment policy statement and philosophy statement. And when I was starting out, I have to tell you that one of the fa the flaws that I experienced was that I got caught up with shiny new object syndrome. Oh, here's a new theory. Oh, here's that new theory. And so, you know, it is that plan that you can stick with that you're going to get better results with. Uh, draft your investment policy or philosophy statement now. Um, so there we go. Um, mm -hmm. Connie Yu, whom I just adore, uh, she says, great presentation. Uh, so yay. Thank you. And Bye. Dylan, Dylan is also um, awesome. She, Truly great info and research. Appreciate your time. Paul, you Thank had you. as many and more kudos too. Um, Thank you. Let's see. Um, John asks another question about if you're already retired, what target date fund do you choose? Do you choose the target date fund of the year that you retired? Yeah, I do that in general, you would do that. Now, you may or may not be able to find one far enough back in time because they're a relatively new invention, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, let's say you retired in 2000 and you want to use a target date fund, you would look for one that was as close to that. It might be 2010 or something, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, as close as you can get. Okay. And I, um, and I think and I that uh, some people, by the way, uh, are in a 401k plan with a target date fund that, that they may look at the glide path and think it's too conservative. So they might want to extend their uh, theoretical uh, retirement date to a later date because they want to up the exposure to equity. So. Okay, great. I actually had someone contact me who could not attend this event and asked me to ask this question. By the way, she and I bonded because one of your best articles and resources that you have on your site, and you're going to laugh, is um, turning $3,000 into $50 million. When I saw that article, I sent it to every new parent I had. And then I tried to con convince all of my cousins to let me pimp out their kids as models so that I could set it up in a Roth IRA or a solo 401k for them. And um, I got x nade on that part, but I got them to read the article at least. So here's the question. Your asset allocations are used by many people to create the path to the retirement they have envisioned. Do you suggest adjusting these allocations as you near retirement age, much like you would with a target date fund, or select one portfolio based on your risk tolerance and write it out the entire way? And by the way, when she wrote me, I said, you'll be very interested in Chris's presentation. So she's going to tune in later. Okay, so what, what do you guys all say to this? I think everybody needs 
a glide path. No, everybody needs maybe five glide paths. Ooh. One is the glide path of saving. One is the glide path of equity versus fixed income. One is the glide path of what equities uh, during a period, over a period of time. Those kinds of glide paths uh, all have to do with what somebody concludes is in your best interest at whatever age you might be. And you've got to find somebody, I think, as a guide, whether it's a glide path we come up with. I mean, Chris has put together on the website a glide path from birth to death. Well, actually, not to death because it only goes to 75 and I'm 76. But, yeah, let's hope, let's hope, <laughs> yeah, let's hope it doesn't go to death. But, but the point is, <clears throat> is, that, is that wouldn't it be wonderful if you had a success, mechanical success formula for a lifetime that we could trust? And, and the only thing to me that I mistrust are some of the dastardly things that go on inside the corporate world, if you want to look at it like that. So what do I like? I like the index funds. It doesn't matter who's, I mean, you, you're, not, you're not counting on anybody. You're counting on a system, the total system. And I think that total system is going to be a lot better for me and my family than the little pieces that can turn against me that I can't protect myself from because I'm not smart enough to tell the best the difference between the best and the worst people out there. So uh, I'm just looking for massive diversification and a glide path for all those different things. What glide path would you guys add? Have I missed a glide path? Well, I, no. I, I think when I think about the fixed income choice, I think of two different ways to pick it. So usually, Paul, when you describe the fine tuning table, you describe it in what I would call an emotional self-assessment. It's like, you know, I can sleep at night if my worst drawdown is going to be 30%, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a very valid way to choose your fixed income allocation. And that probably will change with time for people, right? So in that sense, yeah, they would rent, they would pick an allocation at 20, but maybe it would be different at 30 or 40 or 50 or 60. I think what there's about this. What about what, this for these Daryl, were you going to say something? Well, I was no? going to finish. I, so I had a. So I think the second the second way to do it is the bucket strategy, right? Oh. And and the bucket strategy says, you know, I need to have confidence. I have money for the next three years, five years, seven years. You know, whatever that distance is, and I'm going to have a certain amount of money in cash and fixed income to cover that. And then the rest is going to be in longer term investments, right? Maybe equities. And that strategy doesn't necessarily vary with age. It varies as much with how much net worth you have, right? So I think both of those are appropriate strategies and they're good things to think about periodically along the way. Um, so I, I, think, I think that's another way to come at that mix, right? Is is you can you can do the bucket strategy or you can do the kind of the emotional strategy. Daryl, anything to add before I move to the next question, hun? I'm on board with them. Go ahead. I've got a, I've got a I've got one more recommendation. Sure. Husband and a wife or a, a couple. Two IRAs, maybe two four hundred one ks. I'm thinking diversification here. Four fund combo for one because they got it available to them in their 401k. Two funds for life and another 401k because they got the Vanguard target, target date, date funds. Mm -hmm. And then they got stuff going on in their IRAs. Well, well, wouldn't it be wonderful if a person actually decided to take their Roth IRA standing alone over there and put it all in value, all in maybe all in small cap value? Mm-hmm. And looked at it not as one company, but as hundreds and hundreds of companies that they're going to invest in, almost like they were paying down a mortgage. They're paying five hundred dollars a month to pay off the, the owning this company that's eventually going to be worth millions. You could diversify amongst several different strategies. They may even be strategies of three of us haven't thought of, but they're 
what they're doing is they're overlaying another level of diversification. As these guys know, I have half of my own portfolio in market timing. Mm -hmm. Okay? And that's disgusting to people who believe in buy and hold. But you know something? Market timing is just another level of diversification in my portfolio managed by somebody else because I wouldn't ever want to do that myself. Absolutely. Well, oh, go ahead, Paul. Or Daryl. Well, but, but one thing that I've learned from Paul is that market timing is not there to increase your returns. It's to protect you from the downside or the dark side. Mm -hmm. it, it, it won't, it won't necessarily increase your returns it may, but it, it, it helps smooth the emotional ride. Mm -hmm. a little bit. Well, and for me, I would think of the fact that I want to buy when the market drops and returns back to 2017 values as a little bit of market timing on my own, right? If I have liquidity and extra excess cash, so in a weird way, for those of us who are positioned well enough to uh, invest when the market downturn, I think that's an interesting you know, thought to, to shift that on. Um, I'm gonna show this question from Tracy Bidiger. If an investor is already in some actively managed funds with higher fees, is it worth mm -hmm. it to pay some capital gains taxes now to get into index funds for lower fees. She'll retire in two years at age 60. Based on her question, it sounds like her funds are actually in um, after-tax accounts. Because she doesn't, she wouldn't pay capital gains in right. her 401k oh, yeah. or yeah. tax advantage accounts for retirement. What do you guys think? Is it worth it for her to move to? It, it's hard, you have, to, you have to know more, but here's one thing that often happens with actively managed accounts. Mm -hmm. over the years because they have capital gains that they have already distributed and people have been taxed on mm -hmm. and they think that they have more in untaxed capital gains than they actually do. Mm -hmm. The other side of the, the, that question is what is that, that money likely to be worth over the next 35 years? Because I have no idea what kind of mental or health this person is, but let's say that that person's in really good health and might live another 35 years. Let's say that the active management causes them a 1% lower rate of return and mm -hmm. more taxes and more taxes along the way. I have a hunch if you, if you ran those numbers, you'd find that it is worth it. But if they're only going to live for five years, it probably wouldn't be worth it. There's some analysis that needs to be done. If only we knew what our expiration date was going to be, that we could pass, you right? know, plan, you know, with the end in mind. But be unfortunately, careful what you ask for. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. yes, yes. Um, but I do think about that. In fact, yeah. I actually played with a longevity calendar uh, calculator that was fascinating. But um, another story, another time, you guys. We, yeah. we should grab a drink after this. All right, if you can stick around long enough. Steve Hay writes, are four fund strategies appropriate for retirees in 60s who tend to be conservative? Uh, hmm. Look at that sigh. Spit it out, not all, not all investors in their 60s are conservative. So for a conservative investor in their 60s, um, I think it depends on how much they have in bonds or fixed income. That's mm -hmm. it, uh, mm -hmm. right? That's the key. It's the fixed income versus equity ratio, not not how you not necessarily how you distribute your equities. Let us also remember. Also depends on whether you. Also depends on whether you're going to 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 need it uh, need m most of it now or in the shorter near term, or whether this is for your heirs. I'm stepping on Paul's oh. Paul's. Uh, no, but, under here, but uh, think about those tables that you created, Daryl, that showed right. the four fund versus the S and P five hundred over all those decades. Now, which one is more risky, the S and P five hundred or the four funds? When you look at those decade returns, yeah, I was going to see if I could find them here right now, and now I've lost them again. Well, um, so I just want to make sure everyone knows uh, before we go back to Daryl. 
for copies of the presentations today and other resources, especially if you're new to investing, go to choosefi.com Merriman. We have a list of resources that were curated by Paul that I got from him. And we put together an email that we're gonna shoot out to you with his resources and all of the, all of the handouts. And of course you can also find them at paulmerriman.com. And go ahead, Daryl, did I buy you enough time? So, yeah, so is there a way to sh for me to share my screen here? Absolutely. Did you um, go ahead and did you did you download the you have to install the extension in Chrome? Oh, I did not then. Okay, oh, but, okay. but I'll tell I'll tell you where to go to look sure. at it. Um, unless you happen to have it handy, Chris or, or Paul. Or actually, I can even it's, share it. Where do you want me to go? It's it's on Paul's site. It's under the best advice, and it's ninety years. It's it's oh, yeah. the bottom oh, yeah. one. It's ninety years of something. Yeah, I was just looking yeah. at it this morning. Yeah, so that those are the charts that I think they're referring to, and well, yeah. it's kind of interesting when you look at the four equity classes. If you if you look at it in terms of large and small and growth, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, large and small and blend and value. Mm -hmm. um, if if you look at that, you can see how uh, how they all kind of change places if you look at them at, in the decadal view, for example, or every 15 years or 30 years, depending on your time horizon. Um, it's interesting to see how they sort of sort themselves out over time. There you go. There okay, there. so which, which, I'm sorry, can look you, at the, uh, look at the, look at the there's a ton of feedback. Now. There's a ton of feedback without the headset. Hang on a second. Um, I'm sorry, which one did you want me to navigate to? Look at the first one for now. That's fine. Table one, okay. I think it's called. And yeah. I'm actually going to, I'm so sorry, guys. Would you be offended if I hid you? So that this. Yeah, no. please do. Not at all. all. Right. Yeah, go ahead. All right. There we go. Big. And big. there you go. How's that, people? I mean, when I first saw this table, I went nuts. <laughs> it sorry, just Paul. tells. It tells a story. No, no. I mean, because you can, the different colors, I think we should, we should say that that bright blue color, and you can't make it any bigger. Is that what you're going to tell us? Oh, no, I could probably okay. scale it. Okay. Because, you know, okay. I have technology. Yeah, that's better. That yeah. bright, okay. that bright there you go. blue color, that's small cap value. Mm -hmm, it's right number here. one in the, in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. It's number one in the 2000 through 2010 period, and it certainly is number one over the whole period. S&P 500 is number one in the period from 1990 to 99 and 2019, um, 2010 to 19. But you can see, as I said before, aha, mm -hmm. that the S&P 500 has some very disappointing, unsettling, maybe get you thinking about changing your portfolio strategy because it's so disappointing. We don't want that to happen. But look how that four fun combo just, just lays in there so beautifully kind of in the middle, never on top, never on top, but number two, three out of the nine years and and, and number three in, in four out of the five. That is less risky, less volatile. Oh, go to the next one. Go to the next one, if you will. Of course. Let me just because play I want to want to break it out without all the other. I just want to see uh, the four fund combo and the S and P five hundred. I think it's table three, Jen. Yeah, just one second. I gotta reduce it back, and I think that I am looking actually. Huh, how did I get into your WordPress site, Paul? I don't know. Does that mean you own us or something? You oh, can God, no. Us? No, no. And besides which, I'm a white hat, if anything. <laughs> let's let's be honest. Yeah. I'll be a white hat hacker, if anything else. But let me just go back. Huh. Oh, you know what it is? Duh. Here we go. And we want to look at um, table, table three. three. Table three. There, there you go. There you go. You know, it gets rid of all the noise. And you just look at... The competition, would I recommend the S&P 500 along with fixed income or would I recommend the four fund combo along with fixed income? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I this love these charts. Right at the bottom, it's disappointment. And <laughs> disappointment causes people to stop, stop trusting. 
Yes. Um, Behavioral yeah. issues are, are deadly. Yes. Yes. Always. Well, Always. If you, if you, to get back to what Chris was talking about, if you go down a little further, Jen, to the, what is it, 15 or 30 year periods? Chris, which period? Yeah, go down, go down to, go down one more, probably table six. Yeah, he's staring you right. Yeah, there, there you, go. you go. So those are for 30 year periods. There were three separate 30 year periods, four separate 30, or I'm sorry, 20 year periods, four separate 20 year periods in the data that we had mm -hmm. from 1940 to 2019. And there you go. Yeah. The, if, if your time horizon is is sufficient in the past, history has history has helped you out. Um, in the past, your time horizon has given you the the advantage to or the ability to take advantage of that patience by investing in small cap or the four fund if you want a little smoother ride. Right. Um, I'm going to say at this point in time, again, just a reminder. Uh, we are not your financial advisors. This is only for educational right. purposes and past performance, not indicative of future returns. There you go. <laughs> okay. So um, shall we, do we want to go back to the rest of the questions? Sure. Or do you, okay, great. And I'm going to hide my window and add you all back in because it's more important that they see you. Um, I think my computer's now going, how many more windows can you possibly have open, Jen? And so bear with me. I should have sprung for the quad processor, obviously. And um, let me... We'll make an offer, by the way. Jen, Jen we'll make an offer. Oh, uh, the really? Three of us, the three of us were on uh, an AAII presentation this morning. Uh-huh. We got buried with questions we could not get to. <laughs> and to surprise the extent, me. because we're coming up on the four o'clock hour here or seven o'clock on the East Coast, to the extent that we don't get to all of the questions here, then we're going to do, it's either going to be a Zoom presentation or it's going to be a podcast, mm -hmm. but we're gonna answer those questions. Uh -huh. I'll do that with or without these gentlemen. If, if, if they have the time, great. If they don't have the time, I understand they already devote a ton of time to this effort. And so yeah. I, I, I would cry, but I wouldn't be disappointed. Well, I also want to let you know we have about 127 people still watching us live who are mm. here. And I, wow. I, I, I just love the fact that they're still here with us. And Brian Henry writes, he's one of the guys from my San Diego group. Thanks for the great presentation today. Um, and then uh, let's see. There's By the way, I have a very big family. So that explains <laughs> part of that. Oh, too funny. All right. So uh, John Fredbeck writes, what to do if your Vanguard 401k has crappy small cap options, just an extended market index and small cap growth funds? Should he take the small cap growth funds? I would probably look at doing the two funds unrebalanced in a second account. You know, just go go put put some money into a good fund choice at a brokerage and uh, let it let it ride. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's the question. Is there a match involved? How much is he investing? If he's fully funding and there's no match, I guess the question would be, does he qualify for a Roth IRA that he could go out and do uh, what he wants to do and, and still get enough money tucked away for between the, his wife or his spouse and himself? And also the question of the small cap growth, is it, is it a high expense? Is it a, is it a low expense? That, mm. That's a consideration. Um, and, and, Every once in a while, and I I will work overtime to try to help people who want this. I will try to help convince the trustees of a 401k, if we have any access to them, to add some funds to their portfolio. I get so sometimes I will see a DFA small cap blend fund in a 401k. And I can't figure out. Why did they choose that fund rather than the DFA small cap value? 
who mm -hmm. made the presentation. So there's some work to be done in helping our trustees do the right thing for employees. Mm -hmm. And as a former HR manager, I'm going to tell you now, uh, you can have sway. I have persuaded companies once I've stepped down from HR mm -hmm. or joined other companies in uh, reshaping their funds and investment options. So don't don't yep. forget to petition your, your employer. I have a really interesting question from Micah McDonald. Uh, hey, Paul Merriman and Chris Patterson, have you considered running the numbers for a variable withdrawal rate with a variable percentage for over savers? Example, during up years, withdraw half of, of the portfolio growth, such as up to 10%, withdraw 5%, then in down years, simply withdraw only the dividends. Thanks for all you do, Micah. Uh, I think Daryl's considered it. I yeah. haven't. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm actually looking at that right now. It's a. It's a combination of a, of what Chris called a fixed with withdrawal strategy, where you take a, a, a fixed inflation adjusted amount, and then on top of that, this is for over savers. On top of that, you have a variable withdrawal strategy, where you take six percent of whatever is above what you need to fund your living expenses. Mm -hmm. portfolio size, uh, portfolio share, and use that as a variable um, variable withdrawal amount. And I'm, I'm just starting to put that together and take a look at that. Um, um, when do you think that might be available? Uh, when, my, my, when my wife lets me finish it. <laughs> okay, sorry, I didn't mean to put you in a tough spot there. No, 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 no. It's, no, no. it's very interesting and, and it actually uh, I can make significant progress on it um, in, in a relatively short amount of time. So I'm hoping, hoping to have it done sometime shortly. That's without awesome. Being too awesome. precise. And well, I didn't mean to cut you off. So there are sorry. so many different ways you can look at this. Somebody, for example, that starts, they've saved enough. And so they can only take out the 4%. Well, what happens if they get up to, they start at a million? Let's say they get to what? A million two fifty. Could they take four and a half percent at a million two fifty? And then let's say they get to a million and a half. Could they take out four point seven? I mean, there's a whole bunch of ways you can mechanically oh, yeah. test this. Mm -hmm. And uh, and, and Daryl, I think maybe what you just described is is the same thing as I'm thinking about. Weren't you also looking at people actually having, or Chris, maybe this was your idea? to have people have two accounts. One account takes care of their basic cost of living. And a totally other account is, is, is for all the goodies in life, giving away extra travel, maybe take out a higher percentage, but it's not the part that you need to take care of the basics in life. Yeah, that's that's kind of what the fixed plus variable withdrawal okay, okay, uh, distribution got it. strategy got it. is looking at. But there's another there's another twist on that, and that's that even if you start out with the having just saved just enough case, like Chris was talking about, um, most of the time as you take out your your living expenses, your inflation adjusted four percent, most of the time your balance is going to grow up beyond where you started, in fact. And so then there's another strategy that says, well, if that happens and I only, if you start out with a million, five years later, you don't, need, if a million was gonna last you 30, you don't need a million to last you 25. And so you're, you, you've got a buffer there now and then you can start taking that out. The problem with that is that, of course, that pushes all the fun, fun with, withdrawals to later on, yeah. but, uh, but it's a different strategy and it's a, another way to look at it. Um, I had a question that actually floated off the screen, so I can't display it, but someone asked whether or not all of your returns and numbers were calculated uh, with dividend reinvestment. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, whoever you are that asked that question, hope you got that. All right. And then we had this really other, oh, you know, we can keep you here forever, you guys. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm cherry picking right now. Um, Dave Pratt writes, seems like a big negative of target date funds comes after retirement and not being able uh, to set up a bucket withdrawal system, cash, bonds, equities, all in different buckets, allowing the retiree to withdraw from cash and bonds when the equity market is down, leaving your equities to recover. Your thoughts? 
and or do you have any mitigation strategies for that? I would agree with it. Uh, you know, you simplicity always comes at a cost, and that is one of the costs, right? It's less control. Um, is that going to dramatically change your outcome? Probably not. You know, but it it will make a difference. So if you're sophisticated and patient enough that you want that control, then it's it, there aren't a lot of funds in a target date fund in retirement. Um, you, know, you could mirror it pretty simply uh, mm -hmm. with uh, a collection of funds. So I, I think to the DIY investor who has that question, it's probably very doable to actually solve the problem. Yeah. Right. Well, okay. remembering that a target date fund at Vanguard, as Chris mentioned earlier, you build it yourself, you save money. What do you save? About five one hundredths of one percent, Chris? I, I haven't run the numbers recently. Okay. I'm going to, but I haven't but, run it recently, yeah. But they have basically they have uh, total market US, total market international. Yeah. They got an international and they'll bond. tell you what they'll tell you the funds, right? They'll even tell you which funds are right. in there. So it's yeah, it's easy. And they're cheaper if you buy them one at a time. I mean, just the fund. They yeah, charge about you, 15 basis points, I think, if you buy the, the collection. For the target date, right. Yeah. yeah, but you can buy them for about five basis points cheaper if you buy them individually, which would then give you the, the opportunity, if I understand the problem, to do some of that cherry picking. Yep. And it makes it easy to add the, the small cap value or something, a, a little bit of something if you want to. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of people here. Uh, Connie, you wrote that uh, she could hear you talk all day, Paul. Oh, I want her to talk to my wife. Please have her talk to my wife. <laughs> okay, Connie, I'll give you Paul's number only with his permission, though. Um, Brett Hardeback asked where he could find that chart comparing the two funds for life to the vocal head method. Did, Which Boglehead method is he talking about? I'm assuming that the Boglehead methods are those simplified portfolios, but I thought we had done oh the three fun, the three fund portfolio yeah that, the three yeah. fund portfolio. I'm assuming that's what he's referencing. Um, did you have a special chart for that? Because I saw your four fund uh, with those annualized returns that we just threw up. But, well, the 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 three fund portfolio would be total U.S., total international, and total U.S. Mm -hmm. bond. Um, yeah. It wouldn't be hard to do because I think the data is yeah, the data I don't for think the funds goes back a ways, but you could even reconstruct it with, with indexes back further, probably. And, and again, it's uh, it's trivial to go and do quick back tests of those allocations at portfolio visualizer yeah. if somebody wanted to. So you could you could go do it on your own this afternoon and absolutely. Uh, it's, it's easy. really easy. <laughs> yeah, it's the one of my favorite resources. Yes, but the risk is, depending on how it only goes back as far as the fund that goes back the least. Yeah, you so, need to watch your calendar. So you need to be careful and look at how how long a time period it's good for, because sometimes it's not good for very long. Mm -hmm. A lot of those things are only good for the last great bull market, and that's not a great span of data to use. True. Yeah. Well, I mean, a big question for all of us, uh, the viewers and the three of us, is how much information is really enough? We go back to 1928 on a lot of our work. Mm -hmm. And then we go back to 1970. Uh, that's 50 years back to 1970. Is that enough? If you have good data going back to 1928, yeah, it's hard to tell. And you can it's, only be, it's a, yeah. statistically. Statistically, it's probably not. You're only looking at one sequence um, in history. And unfortunately, we don't have data for any longer sequences, much longer. I guess there's some data sets that go back to 1871, but they probably don't have a lot of international small cap value in them. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the problem. <laughs> And that's the problem is you go back in into the mists of time, you start losing some of these asset classes and they start falling off pretty quickly once you get past 
the 70s as you go back. Yeah. So it becomes harder to back test some of these uh, newer types of uh, portfolio strategies. Yeah, I'm, I'm also going to bring up a question that fell off of our stream, so I can't actually bring it on screen for you to see. But one of our, a couple of our viewers asked, if you were going to implement any of these strategies and all you had were, uh, and you had a pre-tax and uh, post-tax or tax event, where would you most likely put your, your funds? Does that make sense? I've got to go find that question in the regular stream, but basically, he was talking about uh, ideal locations for asset classes for tax advantage, uh, you know, to minimize taxation, perhaps. Please read Successful and Secure Retirement by Larry Swedrow. Oh, I love Larry Swedrow. <laughs> he does that work beautifully, beautifully. Mm. Okay, you hear that, Dylan? I think you were one of the guys that asked about that question. So your complete guide to successful and secure retirement by Larry Swedrow. Oh, too fun. That's actually one I have not read. So thank you. Um, we also, I, I think we're gonna take the last three and then we're gonna call it a night so these guys can get some rest and have dinner and be with their families. But uh, on the behalf of the Choose FI community, thank you so much. Um, thank you. So we have, here are the others. Um, Location where to add small cap value for taxes. Look at that. And my bonds are in my 401k, S&P 500 and total US are in taxable. Value well, stock, go ahead there, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, it, it, well, given the data that we showed in the four funds, the, the small cap value has the highest potential return mm -hmm. uh, over time, I'd stick it in a Roth. I agree with that. Thoughts? Yeah, I agree. I, you know, I, yeah. I, as you can tell, taxes is not our deep area of expertise, though. So. <laughs> yeah. Again, we are not your financial advisors. Right. This is education yeah. only. Remember, you're not with the Roth. You're not going to have to take a minimum required distribution. That's mm -hmm. a big deal, right? Yeah. Yeah, and you don't have to pay taxes on it. Even well, yeah, that's your RMD, right? You don't have to take an RMD. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark Pascal, Mike Pascal. Uh, ask with target date funds often being funds of funds, do they become more expensive fee wise with fees on fees? I like Vanguard target date funds, which are very reasonable. We're looking at 18 basis points, I think is the most expensive, but I'm going to let these guys answer it. Thanks. Yeah, I, um, I agree with you. Vanguard, Vanguard, not just cheap, but they're also uh, investor owned. So there's no conflict of interest. There's, a, there's a lot of reasons to like Vanguard. You do pay a little bit. You, I mean, it's not a lot. It's a few basis points, right, mm -hmm. for the premium to have it managed for you. So, is it, you know, is it worth it? I think for a lot of people, it probably is, just because I, I think there aren't a lot of people who really want to mess around with their allocation and rebalancing and dynamically managing it and stuff. But yeah, there, there's a fee. It's not free. But there's at at Fidelity, they they only have one level of fees uh, in their index funds, to the best of my knowledge. I don't know how companies decide. I think they just think they can get away with it. Mm -hmm. And so they add another level on top of the level of fees that are already there. Mm -hmm. And as as you know, at Vanguard, it's there's one fee uh, and that's it. And I think that's true of Fidelity. But if Fidelity... I just I want you to be careful and use their index based work, not their actively managed work. It's not just it's not good to, to say go to Fidelity and do a, a, a target date fund. No, you got to be in the right target date fund. Absolutely, at Fidelity. And just remember, all the glide paths are different in target date funds across each of yeah. the providers and brokers. Um, so, Emmanuel. Oh, I'm not going to even try the last name. I'm so sorry. Uh, what is the best strategy for investing for my children? Oldest is 17, twins are five, and my daughter is three. I have Utma accounts for them with Fidelity. I'm looking to take advantage of compound interest. Currently investing in VSKAX. Thank you. Each one of us ought to answer that because we all try to help others at that age. Chris, uh -huh. do you want to start? Uh, sure. I mean, first of all, Emmanuel, awesome. 
I mean, it's just fantastic to be trying to help that generation take advantage of all the years in front of them. I, uh, you know, I think the same principle that applies in choosing an investment strategy you personally can work with kind of applies to you in choosing the investment strategy you're going to use for younger people while you are managing it, right? So all of the data that we just showed says small cap value would do really well over the long haul and that you've got a higher chance of a good return. Um, but you need to do a little bit of a gut check um, about whether you believe it enough that you're going to stick with it for their, you know, on their behalf as, as you're writing it out. And maybe that just means looking away, right? Which is a great strategy. Sometimes just look away for 10 or 20 years. Um, so uh. you know, just kind of translating it for my own kids. Cause I, I have kids and grandkids that we work with in that range. I, I basically put them in small cap value and then taught them a lesson. I sat down and said, just so you know, I'm putting you in this really risky thing that could go up and down and it might scare the pants off of you. Uh, don't touch it. Just leave it alone. You know, and I believe it'll be OK for the long haul. Kind of trust me on this one. Um, and I figured it's going to be in the long run, a small part of their overall portfolio. So that concentrated risk and taking a gamble that will pay off for them, I'm OK with, you know, but. Uh, yeah, it's got to be what you what you can stick with on their behalf until they can stick with it. I don't know. What do you what do you think, Daryl? Well, we don't have children, so I don't I don't I don't have to think about that. <laughs> but I think Your you're dog? right. In that, sorry, a dog. <laughs> oh, no dogs. They've all left. Um, unfortunately, Gee. but uh, but I think. If you look at the at the risk curves or the drawdown curves, for example, that Chris showed in the two fund for life presentations, mm -hmm. um, I guess that was based on continuing contributions. So maybe that's not a fair comparison. Uh, but when you're younger, you can your your human capital is all in front of you, and so um, taking risk on their part until they can learn and understand and take the risk themselves is I would think that's a good strategy personally, not that I'm advising anybody to do that, but. Educational purpose. Education. Right. Yeah. And I agree. I'm a small cap value for the kids and the grandkids. And, and, and uh, um, we, we had a deal with our, I've got kids in their twenties and kids in their, 50s and the 50 year olds we've gone through the whole thing where we funded iras and the deal was you touch that ira before you're 59 and a half or before i die i mean uh, if i die the, all the bets are off i can't be uh -huh. there i said that'll be the last money you'll ever get from me <laughs> so wow they, none of them have ever touched the <laughs> touched the ira to the best of my knowledge oh yeah. so emmanuel also i'm going to refer to that article that i said that i sent out to mm -hmm. all parents uh it's how to turn three thousand right. dollars into 50 million i think it's going to have some really great resources for you in there and that's on paul merriman's site so um, stick around. I've actually posted that in a comment in the Facebook watch uh, videos. Uh, if, so if you look at the comments and you see something from Choose a Five that talks about that article, um, it'll be there. Don't forget to go to Merriman, uh, chooseafi.com forward slash Merriman for uh, resources and the takeaways from the presentations today. Uh, we're gonna get that out to you. So um, Popeye LaRue is back and he's sorry to ask you these questions. And I'm going to keep you here as long as you guys can indulge me. Sorry to re-ask this. Uh, again, he was the uh, money market fund versus bond funds as ballast. I'm concerned that due to the ultra low rates that the MMF can be safer than bond funds versus the long bull market in bonds that's continued to this day. And then he goes on to say, consider taxes and the need to rebalance up to the 10 funds plus the bonds. Is there a sweet spot that perhaps the four fund or one of the other portfolios will outperform the ultimate buy and hold portfolio? It seems that turnover costs can add up to uh, to outperform the potential increase in returns. Anyone? Well, uh, I'll take a, a cut at this. Uh, mm -hmm. There are some tables that Daryl has put together that we have not made public yet. 
Ah. And it actually shows uh, the comparisons of 30, 40, and 50-year returns of the ultimate buy and hold, uh, S&P 500, and the four fund combo. Now, there are a lot of combinations that are not included because the ultimate buy and hold we show is a 50-50 U.S. international. In fact, we also do 70-30. So this is only a small part of, of what we have, but I think these tables are great because they allow you to see that there are some periods that four fund beats worldwide and other periods that worldwide beats four funds. Now, to be fair, worldwide beats four funds more than four funds be, beats worldwide. Uh, the question about, about the taxes and whatnot, uh, and I'm, let me just assume for a second, we're talking basically about tax deferred or, or tax free accounts. Uh, the cost you're going to have is the cost of the spread when you buy and sell these particular ETFs. But the fact is, you could build quite a portfolio of ETFs and probably never rebalance. Now, Chris, I got to ask you for permission on this one. What would you say if I said, I want to do the 10 fund strategy, I want to put money into it over a period of years? And I want to do it whether it's at M1 or I want to do it at some brokerage firm, a Vanguard or Fidelity, whatnot. How bad an idea is it to just go ahead and keep plowing that money in there? Don't do all the trading because every time you do the trading, there's going to be potentially some minor cost. What do you think? You know, for somebody who is in the accumulation years, the way M1 Finance does it, it automatically contributes to the underrepresented asset in your portfolio. So mm -hmm. it's continuously rebalancing. Um, so it's quite likely that they're going to st <clears throat> stay pretty close to their desired allocation, even without ever clicking the rebalance button and having to pay any capital gains. So I, I think... You know, at some point, the higher performing asset classes, whatever they are for that period of time, are going to outstrip the contributions. It's probably going to be not in year one or two, but maybe three, four or five. And they may want to go rebalance. But uh, yeah, it. I don't think it's a I don't think it's an awful idea. You know, it's it's uh, the biggest thing is when the thing you give up when you don't rebalance regularly is control of your risk profile. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not that you give up. You give up some return, um, but I haven't seen data that says it's a lot of return. Uh, yeah. because you're giving up the chance to buy low and sell high, but your risk profile starts to drift around as the assets grow and stuff. But but at a place like M1 Finance, the fact that the contributions are going towards the rebalance mm -hmm. makes it less of a risk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Daryl, anything to add? No. <laughs> no. And that's one of the things I like about M1 as well, is that whole like, automatic reallocation of your contributions to your setup, whatever your pie looks like, right? right. But um, every now and then, because I don't have a pie necessarily, I'll actually just sort of skew my contribution dynamically to um, offset whatever uh, I'm low on. But I automatically rebalance when I can uh, once a year on a non-correlated date. Um, so that's, that's my little DIY thing that I do. Sorry about that. Um, so now, uh oh oh this is pretty interesting so everyone listens to your podcast brantley rogers says thank you for your time i listen to all of your podcasts as do i brantley see you in on the podcast apps um let's see then let's see uh how about one more how about one, one more. more one, one more. more um make it a really juicy one. Oh. Well, there's two and I'm sort of torn. I'm going to do this one because it's about during retirement and what you should draw down from. Do you feel like that's juicy? Sure. Okay. Sure. Uh, Ricky asks, during retirement, should you draw down from the target date fund and small cap value fund equally or draw down first small cap value given it's riskier? Go ahead, guys. <laughs> Sounds like you, Chris. 
totally like how you're um, punting this. Yeah, I mean, I generally, I generally like to use the same kind of approach M1 uses in contributions on withdrawals. So I like to use the withdrawal to get back towards my target location or, or target allocation, right? So if, let, let's say the uh, small cap value has been underperforming its great reputation and the target date fund has actually gotten to a higher percentage of your portfolio than it was supposed to be, I would take money out of the target date, or I mean, yeah, out of the target date fund to bring the allocation back. And that lets you sell high, right? So okay. in retirement, you can't, you're not buying low very often, but at least you can sell high, right? That's the goal. So, so if you want to sell high, sell the thing that has grown beyond its desired allocation. And it, that's what I would do. Yeah. And in essence, that's the rebalancing that happens in my own, yeah. our own account. At the first of the year, yeah. we're taking money. We'd had a good year in equities last year. So when we got our check uh, at the first of the year for what we live on this year, uh, we got paid out of equities. Yeah. And, uh, and, and at the end of this year, the first part of next year, we may likely be paid uh, out of bonds. Yeah. So, and by the way, I just want to say, Jen, to you and to the Choose FI universe, because it is a universe. Yeah, when I last looked, this is some months ago, you had like over a quarter of a million people around the world. How many people do you have now? Oh, I have no idea how many people are listening to our podcast. I think last I heard there were over a million downloads, uh, but I, I, I forget what the time frame is. My entire intent is to help bring subject matter experts closely to our community and try to help bridge that. Um, so we have a lot of thank yous in the audience. Uh, Paul, could you repeat the name of the retirement book and Larry, Larry Swedro's book yes. specifically? Yeah. I have not read that one, so I couldn't it's quote it your off my head. Complete, the complete, your complete guide to a successful and secure retirement. Yeah, I'll post that link up later just to let you know. Okay, so for copies of the presentations today and other resources being redirected back to Paul, please come and visit choosefi.com forward slash Merriman and we'll send you that email with some resources. Uh, unfortunately, the Swedro book, because this was a dynamic presentation, isn't listed on there, but uh, we'll do our best to catch you up. Uh, Paul, I guess since we don't have some of the questions answered, do you want me to try to capture those and send them to you and your team? Please do. Please do. Okay. And I want to take just a moment yes. to thank these two gentlemen because, Absolutely. you know, this is my life. I am uh, buried in this project. And I, I don't mean to make it their whole life because they have a life. And so I, I am just super impressed what they have put in to helping investors, uh, and and there's a lot more yet to come, I think, Absolutely. that are going to help investors. So thanks, yeah. Chris, and thank you, Daryl. You yeah, are it's nice to meet you both. It was fun. It was fun, and yeah. we learn a lot from the audience too. So yeah. you know, thanks, right. thanks to yeah. all the people who asked questions and participated. Because uh, a lot of times I feel like I'm too close to things and it's nice to hear the questions because it helps us remember the things we need to explain more clearly. Mm -hmm. And it's really nice for me to meet the people behind all that research that I devour. So on behalf of the Choose FI community and others that might have been redirected here from your Market Watch article, Paul, um, you know, thank you so much for gifting us your time and your knowledge. And Daryl, the number quenching. Keep it up, man. I love it. I love it. And um, and you know, and I, I have to admit, you guys were one of my go-tos, and I always recommend you just for that whole non-conflict of interest research, the education. You guys have a heart of a teacher, and um, I don't say that lightly. I, I really do believe that. And um, so here are some things I'll get. So choose a five community, and and anyone else who follows Paul and Chris and Daryl, I will gather the questions that are in this stream. Uh, by uh, the end of the weekend. So if you have any questions that you wanted to ask that didn't answer, please add it. But as of eight o'clock Pacific time on Sunday, I will just have gotten all those questions and sent them off. And perhaps they'll address that in their next okay. video or podcast. That's one. Two, 
Um, please, if you are thinking of supporting um, educational foundations, there are two here that can use your help. One is uh, the Merriman uh, Financial Education Foundation, fabulous organization, as well as the Choose FI International Foundation too. So we both, I think both of them are situated to help people like us, the DIYers and those that are curious and to make it accessible. Um, and then uh, before I let you all go, just want to let you know that I have one more event scheduled in May. So all of you all that had tax questions, yeah. next Saturday's event is for you. It is tax planning for the new reality with Sean Mullaney, who is better known as the FI tax guy. And he's going to take on questions. He's got a 20 minute roughly presentation. I'm going to ask you to hold your questions again. And then we're gonna take it all. And I'm hoping you guys will join in if you have questions. Let's let's throw a curveball to him. <laughs> all right, and that is uh, Saturday the 16th, and it will be at noon Pacific time. Uh, the event has already been posted. I will be setting up a live stream so you can subscribe to the reminder soon. And um, hope you have a wonderful weekend, you guys. And um, thanks, Daryl. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Jen. Thanks, thanks, thanks guys. Jen. Please remain in contact. Let me know how I can help and um, be of service to you as well. All I right. really appreciate you. All right. And uh, see you next time. Take care. All right. All right.